everybody, today we are debating creation versus evolution and we are starting right now. Ladies and gentlemen, thrilled to have you here for another epic debate. This is going to be a fun one, folks, as today we are debating a classic on this channel, Creation vs. Evolution. And want to say if it's your first time here, consider hitting that subscribe button as we have many more debates to come. So for example, this coming Wednesday we are very excited as Sal will be debating against Dan, a professor in biology, and Erica will be co-moderating with me. So that should be exciting, and the thumbnail is there in the bottom right corner of your screen for that. Well, let me let you know as well, no matter what side you are on, and all of these issues, we have debates on science, religion, politics, and all of the other controversies out there, we want to let you know, no matter what walk of life you're from, we really do hope you feel welcome. And with that, let's get into the details of today's debate. Very excited as today it's going to be a tag team debate. Each side will get a roughly 12 to 15 minutes split where they'll get to make their case at the front and then we'll go into open conversation followed by Q&A. If you happen to have a question, feel free to fire it into the old live chat and if you tag me with at Modern Day Debate, it makes it easier for me to get every single question in that Q&A list. Super Chat is also an option in which case you can make not only a question for one of the speakers during the, during the Q&A, but also a comment, and of course they would get a chance to respond, and we ask that you be your regular friendly selves, whether it be a question or a comment. And last thing before we get rolling here, want to mention, all of the speakers I have linked in the description, so that way if you're listening folks and you're like, hmm, I like that, I want more, you can hear plenty more by clicking on those links. With that, we are going to get started as our special creation team is going to get the ball rolling. So, I want to say first though, before we officially start, thank you all for, we really appreciate all of you guys being here, standing for truth, as well as, I think, in case someone turned off their camera, if you're able to turn it back on just because it scrambles the picture on me when you, if you turn it off, is you, uh, let's see, we have, let me see what I can, I'm going to readjust it here, give me two seconds. So. As you see from left to right, you see <clears throat> Standing for Truth as well as I'm going to move John back into his spot and then J.L. Warren who is stepping in today for Fight the Flat Earth. We hope Fight the Flat Earth feels better as he's not feeling too hot today and want to say Standing for Truth and John and team and J.L. Warren, thanks for being here, all four of you gentlemen. Thank you for having us. My pleasure, James. Always a great time. Absolutely. And with that, we'll let you get the ball rolling, Standing for Truth and John. John, go ahead, brother. Right up. Appreciate uh, you guys coming out for this. Uh, James, I need to share a doc with you. Gotcha. Um... <clears throat> All right, let me know when that's coming through. Absolutely. It's clear as day. All right. All right, everybody, thanks so much for coming out for this very interesting conversation on creation versus evolution. Obviously, this debate uh, will go in many directions, but before we even get to the fallacies of Darwinism, we must address what I argue makes the entire premise of evolution fruit of a poison tree, and that is abiogenesis through chemical evolution. And my opponents will likely argue that it was much simpler than what we view uh, today as life. And they may even attempt to explain away the improbabilities by saying life exists, therefore the probability is one. However, let us consider if their explanation for the re prerequisites needed for the theory they stake their lives on, to be, if, if it is a remotely plausible to, for it to have occurred in an undirected manner, or if in order for the probability to be one, the rational conclusion is an intelligent agent. Even if simpler parts somehow came into existence, this does not circumvent the requirement for a minimum number of these parts to all exist at the same time in a specific location. Now, while atheists and their origin of life researchers try to avoid this conundrum, it is just that, unavoidable. My event of special creation requires an intelligent agent. 
theirs is nothing but chance and deep, deep time. So let's consider what is recognized as the simplest form of life and how its simpleness by comparison to other forms of life does not actually mean it is simple. The mycoplasm genitalium has a genome of 580,000 base pairs. This astonishing number enables it to contain 470 genes that code for 470 proteins with an average of 347 amino acids per protein. The odds against just one such protein of that length are one in 10 to the 450th power. If we calculate the entire genome, then the odds are one in 20 to the 164,090th power. And this is without accounting for the increased improbability when you consider that nature had to select only left-handed amino acids and bifunctional ones. All of this before considering that these genes must have been in existence at the same time, in the same location, on a prebiotic earth in an environment that is admitted to be less advantageous for the required chemical reactions to occur. Now to put this in context, the total number of particles in the entire universe is 10 to the 80th power. And the total number of interactions by those particles in the history of the universe is 10 to the 143rd. So all of this is before considering the origin of the genetic code, the assignment of arbitrary values to codons, equal amino acids, and the requirement of DNA and transcription proteins and translation proteins to exist simultaneously, even for basic replication to occur. Now I must address neo-Darwinism directly. Here are four positions which challenge the premise of undirected evolution through natural selection being a logical, plausible, or probable conclusion for our existence. First, Adaptation of existing functions to account for environmental condition variance is primarily executed through epigenetic factors or activation of recessive genes, neither of which result in new core functions. These realizations have shaken the entire premise of evolution to its core. Not only are these adaptations the result of variable gene expression, they are not the result of mutations, rather are controlled modifications executed through read, write, and erase nanomachines. Second, the variation of transcription factors and gene regulatory networks results in a significant difference in gene expression. To date, the most studied of these are in relation to cognitive function and show 9 to 23% of variation between chimps and humans, for example. It has also been shown that these differences must work in unison and any degradation of this, of this even to the level of point mutation results in cascade effects, which result in dramatic impairment or death. Not only does this showcase the extreme importance of gene regulation, it also decimates the relevance of similar coding genes in relation to final outcome. Moreover, the significant differences in non-coding regions of the genome become apparent for things ranging from introns, retrotransposons, enhancers, and promoters, to name a few, almost all of which have been dismissed by those against intelligent design. However, the discoveries made in the last decade have now made their relevance unavoidable. Third, it has now become apparent through structural biology that not only is the prescriptive sequence information housed in the genetic code required, it must also be geographically coordinated through dynamic real-time folding to enable gene expression. This applies to interchromosomal data transfer and gene regulation, which not only forces acceptance of physical gene locations being vital, it also decimates the relevance of similar sequences existing in another organism, but housed in completely different physical locations. Not only does this make the sequence similarities irrelevant in relation to undirected natural selection, it also lends credence to intelligent design. Fourth, the prescriptive information in our genetic code uses arbitrary values, the meaning of which is unknown without a translation mechanism. This semantic meaning is immaterial and in no other context could be interpreted without the prior actions of an intelligent agent. Not only must my opponent explain, my opponents explain its origin, they must also account for the subset code base with dual syntax for translational pausing, which is vital for protein synthesis. Therefore, not only does our genetic code provide translation templates and tra translation, translation and transcription templates, it also enables time variable base expression. As this is considered in relation to both abiogenesis and the previous arguments, the now unavoidable reality is that our genetic code is a four dimensional programming code base unlike anything humans have ever conceived. When all this is viewed through the now known reality that not only must the information exist, it must also be in a specific physical location in the genome. To conclude that foreknowledge of the desired outcome is not required for life to exist requires those who dismiss intelligent agents to suspend all rational thought. This leads me to a simple question for my audience and for the opponents. If I asked you about the development requirements for any piece of technology that contains coding, logic gates, programming, nanomachines, and exhibits temporal controls which defy simple cause and effect outcomes, 
before even accounting for the physical structures required for the execution to begin in a specific place at a specific time. It insisted they'd all come into being without an intelligent agent being required. Would you think I was exhibiting rational thought or could even be taken seriously? I think not. Therefore, it is my position that the existence of life by an undirected physical process without the action of an intelligent agent is not only neither logical, plausible, or probable, but impossible. As you consider these arguments and expansion of them throughout the debate, ask yourself this question. Whose position is more rational? Is it those who conclude it is more logical, plausible, and probable that these things cannot occur by chance? Or those who argue, no matter how counterintuitive it is, you must believe this could all happen without a designer being required. Awesome, thanks so much there, James. Let me get my presentation here. Um, thank you, John, let's get it all set up here. This looks like John went just at the seven minute mark. This shouldn't take me any more than seven minutes. So I'll set my timer here. Actually, before I do, thanks so much for doing this debate, guys. Uh, looking forward to this. Thanks so much for filling in there, JL. I think this is gonna be a good, profitable and uh, respectful dialogue. So uh, let's not waste any time here. I've got about seven minutes, so let's get started. Okay, which model is stronger, creation or evolution? The answer to this question will come down to who is making the best testable predictions. This is gold standard in science, of course. Creationists are the ones making testable predictions on DNA function, mutation rates, speciation rates, and more. Let us get right into the model. God said, be fruitful and multiply, not be fruitful and clone yourselves. And so what makes the most sense, both scientifically and theologically, is that God created DNA differences from the start. This is the idea of created heterozygosity. Adam and Eve would have had within their DNA the genetic potential to produce every shade of skin that exists on this planet. Time is not required for the diversity today because diversity can be designed and built into Adam and Eve. This idea of front-loaded DNA differences applies universally across the biblical kinds. A direct prediction of this model has to do with the rate as to when new species form. Predictions are already coming true. Let us use birds as an example. There are approximately 10 to 12,000 bird species alive on the planet today. If all bird species today descend from a handful of bird kinds on the ark, this would predict that roughly two to three new bird species would be forming per year for 4,500 years. Now evolutionists would have us believe that birds today descend from theropod dinosaurs roughly 35 to 65 million years ago. The speciation rate predictions between creation and evolution are significantly different. New species of bird have been documented in real time, as you can see here, with a new species of finch observed on the Galapagos Island. This was after these predictions were made. The resulting species were due to shifts in heterozygosity to homozygosity, and once again, just as predicted. Why are there so few bird species if deep time evolution is true? Why are there only 10 to 12,000 bird species today when evolution were true? We should be seeing hundreds of thousands of bird species. This goes for all sorts of species, as you can see here. Lizards, reptiles, bats, rabbits. I've got all the sources here. How do our opponents today address these problems? How do the evolutionists here today deal with the new genetic boundary study that concluded roughly 90% of all animal life was roughly the same very recent age? I want them to answer this question. Here's a confirmed prediction based on the Y chromosome. The Y chromosome only goes back 4,500 years to Y chromosome Noah and genetic stamps on the history of civilization have been detected. We've got the three major haplogroups found in our mitochondrial DNA that confirms the existence of Noah's three daughters-in-law. How do they address these problems? Let me strongly emphasize the fact that the absolute best evidence for evolution has been overturned and it is now in favor of the creation model of ancestry. The entire junk DNA paradigm has been overturned. The chromosome two fusion has been overturned. The alleged site where the fusion supposedly took place actually represents a highly organized and functional gene. The area is far too degenerate and there's a lack of evidence for the so-called cryptic centromere. How do our opponents here today address these problems. How about homology? Well, we know that human engineers design in homologous patterns. Across the globe, we see shared designs and even shared blueprints. 
What about the so-called existence of transitional forms? Well, think of a military vehicle that blends the features of both a land vehicle and a vehicle built for the ocean. For example, an amphibious assault vehicle. Creationists too predict interesting mosaics. Nested hierarchies as is shown here are simply characteristics of design and reflective of God's hierarchical nature. Lastly, the best examples of evolutionary change are either reductive, degrading to the function of the organism or simply general organismal adaptation or epigenetic. There are no examples that our opponents here can present of evolutionary change, the type that is necessary to take their fish to fishermen. Mutations are detrimental to life, and natural selection is a fine-tuning mechanism that keeps a species as strong as it can be. Dr. Nathaniel Jensen has made incredibly specific predictions on mutation rates, including mutation rates in African people groups not yet known. Molecular clock studies, as you can see here, confirm Adam and Eve and biblical creation. Evolutionists look to time dependency to explain away the data. If our opponents here today disagree with the Eve date derived from straightforward mitochondrial DNA coalescence equations, they need to make testable predictions. When does the molecular clock speed up and slow down? Maybe they can answer this question at the start of the discussion portion. Another major prediction of this model of biblical ancestry involves DNA function. We would predict that the vast majority of DNA and DNA elements are functional. While evolutionists assume much of our genome is evolutionary leftovers or junk, we have preliminary evidence for genome-wide functionality. ENCODE has revealed that over 80% of our genome is actively transcribed into RNA suggesting function. Dan Grauer is the one who said, if ENCODE is right, evolution is wrong. Can the evolutionists refute this? As you can see here from these numbers of papers, we, have, we know that ERVs and other classes of retrotransposons and ALUs, for example, accomplish many crucial functions in regulating gene expression. They help determine cell types, they help with development and even assist in cell stress responses. Here's a fascinating paper that goes over intronic ALUs influencing alternative splicing. This is exactly what we would predict, a genome of functional DNA elements created DNA units of function. What about functional orphan genes that show independent ancestries? How do they explain this incredible class of taxonomically restricted and essential genes? These orphan genes defy universal ancestry. These genes are unique sets of coding sequences that are, are specific to particular organisms and they show no consistent hierarchy. Maybe our opponents can start off the discussion by answering this question or really any one of these extremely important questions. I have a minute here, so I'm almost done. Uh, a couple more questions I would love to see answered in the discussion portion. How do they explain the incredible dissimilarity between chimp and human Y chromosomes? How do they explain the low genetic diversity in human beings? Genesis tells us God created two human beings, Adam and Eve. This would severely restrict genetic diversity. And this happens to be exactly what we find. Evolutionists were shocked by this, which is why they had to post hoc, ad hoc, invent their fairy tale out of Africa population bottleneck. Is this out of Africa bottleneck even remotely feasible? We can discuss that in the discussion portion, of course. Everything we see today points to the death and destruction of a once perfect creation. This includes our genome. What type of selection can be presented that will select away so many deleterious mutations that are pouring into our genetics and degenerating our information systems? We are devolving and not getting better. No forward evolution is observed. Most mutations are unselectable and invisible to selection. An artificially contrived rescue mechanism such as synergistic epistasis and mutation count mechanism have been falsified. Can our opponents today answer any of these questions? We shall see. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Standing. We'll switch it over. So we will kick it over to our skeptical friends, or you could say skeptical of creation, but proponents of evolution. And the floor is all yours. Thanks for being here, guys. Yeah, you're going to be, uh, I'm going to be presenting the evidence today for our side. Um, as we already discussed, hold on one second, let me adjust my mic. As we've already discussed, uh, Fight the Flat Earth couldn't make it today. And J.L. Warren is filling in for him. So it'd be unfair to ask J.L. Warren to, uh, <clears throat> to, you know, present anything for today's, uh, today's presentation. So uh, give me one second. I'm going to be answering a lot of those questions you asked already. Uh, most of them will be answered in my presentation. And I'm ready to start when you are, James. Absolutely. Ready for you. Okay. So uh, you can give me one second to uh, get my, my presentation up. And I'll tell you when to, to share my screen. Or I guess you're sharing my screen right now, right? 
Not yet. I can it. when you want. Oh yeah. Okay. I, I'll, I'll let you know when I'm ready, but go, you can go ahead and put me on screen and I'll, I'll be able to switch over when I'm ready. Um, all right. So, Hey guys, thanks for joining us today to speak about evolution. Today, we intend to provide three pieces of evidence that do support the modern theory of evolution. We will be doing this by, uh, well, with two of these pieces of evidence will come in the form of ERVs. Uh, he specifically mentioned ERVs. It's great that we're having this conversation because ERVs are undeniable proof that evolution and natural selection is, in fact, true. Specifically, the locations of shared ERVs with chimps in the human genome and the ratio of the LTR, LTR discontinuity of ERVs, and the correlation between the two as predicted by the accepted model of evolutionary theory. And finally, we will have a look at chromosome two, which you also happen to bring up, uh, of the human genome and speak on its origins. But before we begin, I think, this, uh, I think with this being an evolution debate, it's only proper that we actually define evolution. Evolution is the mechanism that is responsible for the diversity of life on Earth through natural selection. This is due to the procreation process and life not being 100% efficient. As genes are copied relentlessly in our bodies, slight mistakes or mutations can occur and given enough time are responsible for all life on earth. So let's talk about retroviruses and ERVs. A, retrovir a retrovirus like HIV is an RNA virus. It's, this is key guys. It's an RNA virus, not a DNA virus. Normally, a retrovirus infects a host cell and hijacks its internal mechanisms to create more copies of itself, effectively killing the host cell and spreading its RNA to, to other cells. Every so often, a retrovirus can infect a sperm or egg cell, though. This results in the virus becoming inactive. However, the viral RNA, which is converted to DNA, will become part of the host cell's genome and will be passed on to future generations. Why ERVs are so important to evolution is because they offer us definitive markers in our genes and can help us identify common ancestors in a nested hierarchy. And more importantly, they can test the predictions made by our current model of evolution. But before we get into the evidence, we must first prove that ERVs are indeed viral in nature. In nature. And this goes to answer one of your questions, uh, that one of your uh, suppositions that you put out earlier. Um, so this is easy. Uh, all ERVs consist of several RNA viral specific genes. Uh, this means that without these genes, the, you know, the RNA is not uh, functional. Okay. It can't, without the certain of these genes, you can't transcribe the RNA into DNA. Uh, and then you also can't protect the RNA virus uh, from, so that it can spread from one cell to another. All right. These genes are the uh, the GAG genes, the POL genes, and the ENV genes. All right, the GAG, uh, the GAG gene's sole purpose is to produce the nu uh, nucleocapsid that protects the RNA virus. The POL gene codes for reverse transcriptase, and the ENV gene allows the virus to produce glycoproteins, which allow the viral cell to pass through a future host cell membrane. All three of these genes are specific and unique to retroviruses. The second way we know these are viral in nature are due to the discontinuity of LTR to LTR sites or long terminal repeats that connect the viral DNA to the host DNA using integrase. Uh, now, now that we know generally what an ERV is, let's discuss the two independent ways it validates the standard model of evolution. First is location of the ERV in the genome. I'm sure most of you have probably heard that 96% that, uh, of the human genome is identical and shared with a chimpanzee. I don't think this actually sets into most people, and I'm going to share a screen right here uh, that, that's going to highlight the, uh, the similarities between the human and chimp genome. Now, it, these are the human and chimp uh, DNA strands, si or not, uh, the genome strands, genetic material strands set next to each other side by side. On each, uh, each column has two strands. You can barely tell because they're so similar. If you're not really getting close into the screen or making it bigger, you can't even, in, in some parts, you wouldn't even be able to tell that there are actually two different lines there. That's how similar they are. Now, on the left of each of those lines is the human, ch human uh, DNA. On the right is the chimpanzee, okay, or the chromosomes, I'm sorry. The, the chromosomes for the uh, human on the right are the chromosomes for the chimpanzee. As you can see, they all line up. But there's also something else that, uh, that's important about this. Okay, give me one second to get back to my notes. Um, all right, so this graphic, of course, it shows that these two are lined up, but there's also something that you need to notice. On the short arm of chromosome 10, we find something interesting. 
what's called an ERV, or the fossil of an old retrovirus. Another interesting find is that not only do both humans and chimpanzees share the genetic markers for this particular ERV, but the, marker, the markers are in the exact same position on both the human and chimpan, chimpanzee genome. Now that alone might not seem too impressive. You know, he, he threw out a bunch of big numbers just coming up with them and saying, hey, these are, these are real numbers, right? Well, let's talk about some real numbers. There are 500, over 500 nucle, uh, nucleotides and over 100,000 base pairs on those nucleotides. This gives, at minimum, a 1 in 50 million chance that two identical ERVs place themselves in identical spots on two separate species chromosomes. 1 in 50 million. Now, that's a lot, but the odds of winning the lottery are much lower than that. And people win the lottery all the time. Now let's head over to chromosome 1. Again, on the short arm, we find evidence of another ERV. And again, when comparing to the chimp data, we find the exact ERV in the exact location. The probability of finding this ERV in, this, in the exact location is the exact same as finding the first one, one in 50 million. To find both of them would have to be one in over 2.5 times 10 to the 15, or a really small number. Now that's two of them. And these are just two of the 14 plus K class ERVs that are shared between chimps and humans. One class of ERVs, and we're already reaching numbers that would way surpass whatever number you made up. Now, these don't include W-class ERVs or any of the other ERVs because there's multiple types of ERVs that are shared between humans and other species. All right, so the probability that this is by random luck alone is just too low to be statistically significant. The second strong piece of evidence involving ERVs is the LTR to LTR ratio of discontinuity in ERVs. Due to the nature of how a retrovirus inserts itself into a host genome, the two LTR sites are identical. After insertion, however, any genetic mutations that occur on one LTR site will be unique from the other. And this discontinuity between LTR sites gets passed down from generation to generation and species to species. So I've basically explained ERVs, but I have not yet, or I have yet to really tie down their exclusivity to the evolution model. While I did point out the absurdity that the observation of unique ERVs identical, identical to chimps is completely due to chance, ERVs offer something much more useful to the explanation of the diversity of species. Let's say we have a species who has ERV1 in its DNA. It would stand to reason that if evolution were true, then only descendants of that species should ever have, ERV, have the ERV1. Now let's say that that species splits into two species, species 1A and species 1B. Let's also say that, spe that uh, species 1A uh, contracts a second retrovirus, and we're going to call this one ERV2. It would stand to reason that the offspring of all future descendants of species 1A will have both ERVs 1 and 2, while all descendants of species 1B will only have uh, retrovirus ERV1. If this mechanism, it, it, it's this mechanism that helps out or helps us, uh, hold on, let me see, that helps us design an independent nested hierarchies that at all levels appear to be consistent with the nested hierarchies established well before the science of genetics was born. As far as LTR to LTR discontinuity, discontinuity as previ previously stated, the LTR sites are identical at the, or at the original insertion of the retroviral DNA into the host genome, and given time, random mutations will occur at one LTR site that is not present at the other LTR site. Given more and more time, more and more discontinuity should occur between each LTR site or uh, of an, I'm sorry, not or, of an individual ERV. These two pieces of evidence, because they give the model of evolution, or uh, because they give the model of evolution through natural selection falsifiability, um, give the model or give the model of evolution through natural. Oh wait, I'm sorry. Because oh, I'm sorry. Because these, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm reading from a script right now. There are great pieces of evidence because they give the model of evolution through natural selection falsifiability. Because these pieces of evidence make predictions which we can test today using modern technology. Now, I do want to keep in mind something. The original tree of life, okay, was well before the 
uh, discovery of genetics and DNA. So the fact that the that the uh, the data coming out from new science is consistent with the predictions made from old science stands as a strong indicator that the old science was indeed right as well. Uh, I let's see uh, one instance of this violation, or I'm sorry. Uh, the first prediction is this: if ERVs are genetically passed on to only future offspring of a previously infected species then finding a common ERV in a species that does not share a common ancestor while not finding that same ERV in a species that has a more recent common ancestor um, would, would violate that. One instance of this, in fact, would destroy the evolutionary model. That's all you have to do. Prove me wrong. Find one ERV that, is, that, that I do not find in a common ancestor that I do find in something that we don't share a common ancestor with that, you know, based on time, because we all have one, one common ancestor. So based on time, you find a, a violation of this and you should be able to violate the evolutionary model. The second prediction made is that of LTR to LTR discontinuity. Since the ratio of discontinuity is a function of time, ERVs that are inserted into common ancestors much further back in our history will have a greater LTR to LTR discontinuity ratio than ERVs that are much more recent. And according to Dangle, uh, in a paper published in 1995, the degree of LTR to LTR discontinuity is proportional to the degree of taxonomic separation of the species that share the ERV. Now, what really defines this evidence to be a killer is that both of these predictions are made in, by an independent mechanism. The ERV insert, insertion location is completely independent of the random mutations at the LTR sites. Yet both of these events can be predicted by the understanding of speciation through natural selection and verified with modern technology. The key point to take away from these two pieces of evidence is that random chance alone cannot explain these observations, while the mechanisms of evolution perfectly predict them. The third and probably most damaging piece of evidence against creationism or anti-evolutionism is the second chromosome of the human body. See, humans have 46 chromosomes, 23 from mom, 23 from dad. A couple of creationists, you know, may have an extra one, but that's besides the point. The, great, uh, the three primates that most closely relate to humans all have 48 chromosomes. Now, if the model of evolution and nested hierarchies are to be correct, then this missing chromosome needs to be explained. It could not have just been lost, as that would have been lethal to our, our species, leaving us with just, just two possibilities. Either our common ancestor had 46 chromosomes and the, other, uh, the others gained two chromosomes, or the most likely option was that we originally had 48 chromosomes due to the fact that the other three primates have 48 chromosomes and the human lineage lost two as a result of some other mechanism. In this case, it would be fused chromosomes. All right, so we actually have 48 chromosomes, or there's 48 chimp chromosomes in us, but two of them are fused together to give us 46 total. Now, this explanation cannot be regarded as nothing more than an ad, or I'm sorry, this explanation can be regarded as nothing more than an ad hoc explanation to fill in the gaps. I'm sure creationists surely shouldn't have a problem with that, since God of the gaps is essentially their entire argument. But in the interest of intellectual honesty and integrity, I will posit that if this observation cannot be scientifically, scientifically explained and backed with evidence, then evolution is wrong, bottom line. And sure enough, scientists were able to prove that the human chromosome two has telomeres and centromeres where they do not belong, suggesting that the individual human, that the, uh, suggesting that the two chromosomes fuse together to form one. Now, not only did they find the individual human chromosome that this took place in being chromosome two, but they could also identify which chimpanzee chromosome was the one that it fused with chromosome 13, resulting in the human lineage losing a chromosome pair and passing that on to future generations. Creationists currently have no explanation at all for the fusing of this chromosome and the genetic passing of these mutations on to their offspring, while the evolutionary model perfectly and eloquently describes and predicts these events. In conclusion, the location-specific ERVs that are shared through common ancestry, the ratio of discontinuity of LTR sites is a function of time, 
and human chromosome two are all strong and irrefutable pieces of evidence to suggest that the model of speciation through natural selection is in fact correct. And the creationist explanation of the diversity of life is nothing more than a fairy tale. Gotcha. Thanks so much. Appreciate that. We will kick it back into the main screen. So, JL, if you have anything to add, we can kick the mic over to you. Otherwise, we will get going on the open discussion. Actually, team presented and uh, the ex excellent evidence, and uh, it's exactly where I would have stood. So well, I'm ready to go when you guys are. You bet. Awesome. All right. Floor is yours, guys. Okay. I think um, I'll start here. I, I appreciate that opening uh, team skeptic. That was well done. You touched on some of my favorite topics. So I think this is going to be a really good discussion. I'm sure it's going to fly by nested hierarchies, chromosome two fusion and endogenous retroviruses, for example. Um, I'll give a quick rebuttal and then I'll, I'll follow it up with a question. So as, as I uh, kind of pointed out in my opening, nested hierarchies in general, say in DNA, anatomy and physiology, are also expected by creationists based on the design model. Therefore, when it comes to the endogenous retroviruses and the, uh, the retrotransposons, the question we need to ask ourselves is what are retrotransposons? Posons. Are they really the leftover remnants of viral infections in our DNA? And I know you pointed to the pole gene, the GAG, the ENV, for example. So they do have similarities to RNA viruses, of course. But evolutionists, they've assumed the former. And this is because, as you've pointed out, and, and I agree, they bear strong similarities to actual viruses. So that would actually predict that these sequences are, for the most part, non functional evolutionary leftovers but according to our model uh, hold on can i ask you a question before you move on to the next part because I, I do have a question about that specific topic uh what would be the function of the pol and the uh the gag gene uh before um if, if they were not viral in nature well Let's i, I can directly answer that DNA. on the uh, on the gag gene um for retrotransposons uh, it actually acts as a a security passcode to get it to move uh, into new locations um, right. through uh, portals and such. Uh, it's well documented in uh, different uses of the gag gene. So I'm not really sure what your point is on that. Yeah, can you a, well, give me a demonstrable? Can you uh, give me a, a notation on that? I do have I notations did, for everything. Actually, I, if, I, if I could I, jump in real quick, I've I yeah. put about 12 technical papers in my opening suggesting that these endogenous retroviruses and, and the other classes of retrotransposons accomplish many crucial functions and just to name a few of and I can screen share the papers again but for example yeah, please regulating do. gene expression differentiation and development and what's fascinating actually is many of these retrotransposons they have the start sequence for many different genes especially genes in the brain so these jumping genes they can actually jump around the genome turning on and off genes performing functional roles so my question to you, and you can take as much time as you need to answer it, would you have a technical paper, a peer-reviewed technical paper that can show any one of these classes of retrotransposons, including the endogenous retroviruses, going from non-functional to something extremely functional in our genome, for example, in determining cell types and, and the number of other uh, functional roles? Because that's what we would predict, that they are functional DNA elements, and that's exactly what we what we find to be true. Take your time to answer it and I'll screen share the papers as well. So take your time. Uh, yeah, let me, uh, you, you asked for evidence of a retrotransposon going from non-functional to what? So uh, since the, if you can see here, I'm screen sharing, probably, there's probably a bit of a lag. So, um, so my question was, do you have any like uh, empirical evidence, any technical papers um, that show a, non-functional endogenous retrovirus or any but, uh, one of the wait, I, I'm, I'm seeing the bunch of things jumping around on here right, i'm not right, sure because right. i've got a lot of papers here stop so for example, yeah stop it on one that that gives you that hey what, while your, you're uh, your finding the right please. paper standing nope, um, i'm there i'm there so okay. retroviral promoters in the human genome endogenous non-retroviral rna viruses elements evidence of a novel type of antiviral immunity and, and john can speak to this as well so we do know that they're functional dna elements uh, even the ALUs, fascinatingly, look at this, intronic ALUs influence alternative splicing. So a direct prediction of our created heterozygosity model would be that the vast majority of our genome and DNA sequences and DNA elements, including the pseudogenes, would be functional. Uh, 
and important to uh, the organisms, of course. So, and that's exactly what we, we see here based on peer reviewed technical papers. So if you want to answer and your question, assertion, is, but your assertion is that the non-functional are all just junk DNA that they were, how did they get there to begin with then? Well, that's the thing. These were created units of DNA function. That's our prediction. So we've predicted, and it's in print from uh, intelligent design PhD scientists years ago that we would discover- Intelligent design PhD scientists. Okay, I, okay, I need to- I need a- I just hang need on, a, standing, hang on, oh, Real quick, I know so, you're excited. Okay, go ahead, John, go ahead. I, I'll leave the papers- I just need the references. Since, since our opponent oh, is going to try and go down here. that rabbit hole, uh, let's go science direct. The neuronal gene arc encodes a retrotransposon gag protein that mediates intercellular RNA transfer. Uh, Can you share the uh, paper? Arc protein exhibits. I'm on my phone, man. I can't. I've got the papers here here. if you want to see. Uh, Arc protein exhibits similar biochemical properties as retroviral gag proteins. Endogenous arc protein is released from neurons in extracellular vehicles. Arc EVs and capsids can mediate intercellular transfer of arc mRNA in neurons. That's just one example. There's uh, plenty of those, and that's directly from Science Direct. Okay, and these are trans. And these are trans. These are transcribed from ERVs. From the the components of an ERV, or just components that are similar to uh, components that are in ERVs. See, I don't know because you're not providing it's, me with any information. It's, it's, you're just it's reading the it over a, a cell. Themselves that have can you it. not share the link to that so I can see what you're actually reading? Okay, so are you going to listen to what I just said? Which is, I'm trying. To, my computer crashed. I'm doing this from my freaking phone right now. I can't be doing a bunch of. Well, if he could just answer the question, then we can. I mean, but the, well, the point I'm, I'm making. Okay. The I'm point I'm making is on what he's saying right now. You're, I'll you're your question argue, in a second. You're trying to argue that. Huh? We're not being able to counter this. You specifically used the gag protein as a specific example, trying to play a gotcha moment. And I am right. responding with a specific use of the gag protein for retrotransposons and the uh, <laughs> retroviral uh, elements that it, uh, it is as functional that you just used as evidence for it not being uh, evidence in our favor. So I'm not really sure how you're reaching well, that conclusion if i if i can if, can i can i jump in there and get a little clarification on something real quick jail of course of course go so, ahead jail so real quick i'm just kind of curious what what about this process are you are you questioning that is allowing for the insertion of a creator or a designer in order to explain the the mechanism of what you're saying right so we're saying that these uh supposed ervs the it, it they're claimed to be ancient They're infections not of viruses. Therefore, is, are they really the ancient invasion of, of viruses or are they functional DNA units? And I'm pointing out that the evidence shows that these ERVs are functional, but not only that, they have crucial functions that help regulate genes and even determine okay. cell types. For example, real quick, real quick. For example, I have a paper here that says, far from being junk DNA, and this is in, in peer reviewed journals, the pervasive retrotransposons that populate the genome, and we're, no one's disagreeing that we we find these retrotransposons in our genome, but it says they have a powerful capacity to influence genes and chromatin. So my question is, do you have any evidence that suggests that these are not functional units of DNA function? Yeah, there's no, there is no need outside of a fucking RNA. There's no need to have any uh any transcriptase right there, there's no okay, need so why, why would you hold on hold on why would you need answering the literally undergo reverse transcriptase retro, i'm sorry retro, reverse let's transcriptase chance, let's give team a chance to respond so reverse transcriptase would not be needed for anything that had dna our entire genetic thing our entire genetic code is dna there is no rna in it it's dna okay, okay well, DNA so why RNA. is there why is there a code inside of our dna that codes for the reverse transcriptase gene or uh, protein okay so you obviously don't know exactly actually know what retrotransposons do in many cases especially yeah. in embryo developments where they are physically inserted, taken from uh, from being DNA. In embryo developments, where you moved, have where you have half of the genome, RNA. half of the you genome is your mom, half is the genome is your dad. Yeah. No, no. I'm right, talking, I'm sorry. During, I'm talking post recombination, skeptic. So if you'll shut up and listen, the uh, with the point I'm making, you just said they had no purpose, right? Well, what we now know is that in as as an example, in embryo development. Retrotransposons are put into specific locations during embryo development. That process, which by the way uses the gag protein, is taken from D- DNA, turned into mRNA, transferred by proteins, re- reverse transcriptase back into DNA and inserted into a specific location exactly. during that developmental process. Then, right, it happens twice. Then, hang, on, right? hang, on, hang on, not done yet. Then, this goes back to time based temporal controls that I talked about in my opening statement. 
at different, uh, once that stage of development, development is passed, that same retro uh, transposon is grabbed, is, is, is exec extracted from that position, moved to a different one, and now results in a different outcome when it's reinserted into a different position in the genome. So uh, to say that that does not have uh, significance when studies show that if you don't do that, embryos die. So right. I'm pretty sure that if you can't live without it, that actually constitutes being rather important and having function your mental position aside. Actually, and real quick, I, and I just want to make a quick point without being interrupted, and then Team Skeptic, take as much yeah, time as ahead. you I'm need. Sorry. I just, no, no, that's okay. That's okay. It's a good discussion, and you've brought up some good lines of evidence. Hopefully, we can move on to the, the fusion after this, but this topic deserves um, no, we're not done yet with this. heavy discussion. So, um, no, we can talk about this all day. So, our point is, is that, you know, many of these so-called ancient viral infections are actually very good for us. So these retro transposons, they're jumping around the genome, they're, they're turning on and off various types of genes. Now, as uh, John was kind of iterating regarding embryological development, there's a class of retro transposons in the mouse embryo, okay, that when you deactivate it, the mouse embryo will develop, and then it stops. Well, the question is why it's because it depends on the function of these retro transposons, which the evolutionists have always assumed was junk. So if these are incredibly important to our DNA, and you're saying that they're nothing more than ancient viral infections millions of years ago, were these mice just not having children until they got that uh, viral infection and then somehow that viral infection was co-opted? So the, the very simple okay, question so, is, do you have any yeah, yeah. evidence? But so yes, the, the human placenta, the human placenta is exactly evidence of a, a useless junk RNA virus, ERV, okay, a retrovirus that got induced into or introduced into our, our genome and, and became uh, pushed on from generation to generation, physically changed the way cells uh, bind with each other. And this led to eventually, it didn't immediately happen, but it eventually led to the uh, to the humans being able to have a placenta on the inside of their body and the and babies to be born inside uh, instead of being put out as an egg on the outside. Okay, now we can track this the this ERV all the way back to the beginning of primates or not the be I'm sorry, not primates, mammals. Well, we no, can track this inferred. all the way. We can't track it. It's inferred. You're looking in the fossil record. So you admit you're that no, no. Well, we can we can know. Uh uh. Wrong 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 quick, wrong quick. wrong. Would we you, can go into the genetic. No, we can find this. We can find this ERV in the genetic. Oh, one sec, one sec, so no, of all mammals. But we see the ERVs are there. And and, and the cytokine cytokine one and two. No cytokine one and two. Hold on. Yes, listen. Cytokine. Hold on. No 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 no. Because listen, the the original mutation. One sec. Hold on. One sec. Hold on, bro, bro. Sorry, team. I'll, I'll let you talk in a sec. I, I muted you both just because, just to regain order. Let's give team a chance to respond, and then I promise we'll come back to you standing for truth. Interrupt. Go ahead. Yeah. So, um, so no. So the the actual uh, mammals, we don't even as humans, we don't even use that um, that. Uh, that mutation anymore anyway. We've already gone beyond that to cytokine 1 and 2 proteins that we use for our placenta. So yes, we've continued to mutate away from that original mutation that was because of the ERV. And we can track that ERV across all mammalian species, species not just primates. Okay, here, let me respond real quick. So you can track through genome sequencing, you can track the patterns um, regarding these ALUs, the ERVs, the retrotransposons, yes, they do form nested hierarchical patterns. Therefore, are they there by design or ancestry? So we're pointing out that these ERVs specifically, if you want to focus on that, they accomplish extremely crucial functions in regulating gene expression, differentiation, and development. And this is seen across the entire um, animal kingdom, for example. So you're assuming that they are the result of ancient viral infections. And we're pointing out, no, these are functional DNA elements. And we're listing off function after function after function and paper after paper after paper. So our question to you is, do you have a technical paper you can screen share that could show us a non-functional endogenous retrovirus or any one of these classes of retrotransposons going from non-functional to something extremely functional in our genome? Can you provide that? Actually, if I can jump in there real quick, because there's a problem with the line of reasoning that you're going down, because what you're asking him for would not be evidence for the, would not be evidence to support the insertion of a creator into the argument. 
So whether it exists or not is still not evidence to put a designer or any kind of creator in that fa in that fashion and external, you know, influence. It still would not be evidence for that. And that's where you're coming from. That's the foundation of your argument is the influence of a designer exterior to nat to the natural processes of the earth. Uh, of okay, the planet. So, let, so, let, so let's think about your your point right there. So the point that I was making in the context of the uh, temporal variable control of gene expression in something that until this was realized was considered junk DNA with no purpose, supposedly evidence. You know, you got to stop using the term junk DNA. It's vestigial DNA. That's what it is. It's vestigial. It's well, no longer useful, well, but it's still, it's still it's actually, actually, it's really being called non-coding DNA or gene regulatory networks now is actually the, the real term. Okay. For it. Right. But the, and and junk, actually, junk DNA is a it, it, dog whistles to another area of thought. So, but remember, but remember, well, well, the, a dog whistle is that the, the words that come directly out of people like Dawkins' mouth. Okay. I don't think so, buddy. But the point I was making is you're claiming yeah, that there's no evidence for a designer when I'm talking about uh, time-based variable of argument, control of time-based. Okay, so you suggesting that natural selection somehow had the ability to foresee the future and put in right. time-based controls in two different areas that aren't have zero connection point? No, these are natural functions of natural functions of DNA under under oh, evolutionary oh, oh, right. pressures. Oh, oh really? Really? Time-based control. It's happening in, oh, yeah, yeah. in that, hyper that, no, you're, you're coming with you're, you're coming with argument from complexity is that it's so it, it is complex. It's extremely well, no. complex, but a complexity okay. is not okay. evidence so, so, for let's, an external. Let's think about this. Let's, let's think about this. It's also finish. a confirmed prediction finish. of our model. That's that's the important thing. To no, the problem is, is that no, no. The, the problem is, is that you know, however, however you want to argue the complexities of how DNA works or how how all of these processes work in in, a, in an environment of envir of, in, of evolutionary pressures, none of this leads to evidence that that supports the insertion of an external creator and external okay, uh, hang on. instigator. Yeah, quick, no, I, I just want to make a point Hold real quick. On. I just want to make JL, a point. Do we get all your point there, JL? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so it's it's not just an argument from complexity. It's also an argument from the fact that we're making testable predictions. The gold standard of science is making testable predictions. Evolutionists have always assumed that the vast majority of our genome is non-functional evolutionary leftovers. You can see a recent paper in 2000. 17 from Dan Grar that says, well, if ENCODE is right, which ENCODE revealed that over 80% of our genome is actively transcribed into RNA suggesting function, then evolution is wrong because that means those mutations that are accumulating are going to degenerate us a lot faster than they ever thought. So they have to hold to the assumption that the vast majority of our genome is junk. Yet now we know even pseudogenes, they produce RNAs that increase the expression of their corresponding functional genes, the ERVs, ALUs, all of these other classes of retrotransposons, the non-protein coding RNAs, they regulate virtually all aspects of the gene expression pathway. And we have these predictions in print and they come true and they're confirmed every single day. What kind of predictions can you guys okay. make so regarding DNA function? You, go ahead, go ahead. Let me, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a simple question real quick. Um, how, I want you to explain to me how, the, how it's possible for humans and chimpanzees to both have that ERV on, on, um, on arm 10, on, on short arm 10. How is it possible for both of them to have the ERV in the exact same location with the exact same uh, LTR to LTR uh, I mean, not, not the LTR to LTR continuity, yeah. but the exact same location on both, um, on both of the, the, the arms, on both the species. I'm sorry. That's a good question. That's a good question. So that comes down to my initial um, question. Are they really the ancient, vir uh, ancient infection of, of viruses or are they created units of DNA function? So when it comes to the nested hierarchical patterns, you're right. We do see more shared endogenous um, viruses and, and ALUs, for example, with chimps than we would with uh, the old world monkeys and, yeah, and down the line. We do see nest and hierarchies. Yeah. Right. No, I, right. I agree with that. So that's why that question is, um, are they created units of DNA function or are they the result of ancient viral infections? So I pointed out in my opening that naturally we have, as humans, we have designed things with groups within groups patterns, okay? So if we were to look at the types of vehicles, for example, or even just mo modes of transportation that we have created, we accidentally build in these groups within groups nested hierarchical patterns. For example, if we look at a sedan, uh, they have a tremendous amount of similarities with other sedans. Now, if you bring in, say, a semi-tractor trailer, that's obviously much more different than a sedan, kind of comparing it to like a dog versus a a human being or a chimpanzee, but those two modes of transportation are similar enough to each other that it sets them apart from 
airplane. So we would expect, based on the design model, that humans and chimps would share more of these DNA units than a human and a dog. So the nested hierarchical patterns, though, the, that line of evidence, that observation, that's agnostic to the debate. But the differentiating line of evidence would be the DNA function. Are they non-functional evolutionary oh, okay. leftovers, or are they created units of DNA function? And the evidence okay. suggests that they are functional DNA units. Go ahead. Go no, 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 question. no, 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 no. No, the, 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 but okay, yes, you could say that there's an equal probability on both models until you bring in the LTR to LTR discontinuity as a function of time. So as you sta stated, we do see more, let's say with old world, old world monkeys, okay? Yes. We do see, if we, let's say we have an ERV that we both share with an old world monkey. We expect to see, based on the evolution model, we expect to see every lineage that broke off from the old world monkey, the orangutan, the gorilla, the chimpanzee, the human, we should see that um, ERV in each of those people. But also another prediction that's made because evolution says that r random mutations happen. For it to be random means that some LTRs will eventually have a random mutation on them. If, it, if we were to always see LTRs always exactly the same, then we would need to explain right. that with our theory of evolution. So with, with our model of evolution. So when what we see in the old world monkey, what we should see is the ratio of discontinuity between the two LTR sites should be greater with old world monkeys, a little bit less with, with orangutans, right, a little right. bit less with gorillas, a little bit less I'm with chimpanzees, with and then all the way down to what we have as a human. Now that's another thing. That's a second model that, that validates that works exactly with what we're saying when it comes to natural selection. Well, real quick, yeah. So it's just like your uh, highly conserved mitochondrial DNA proteins, for example, the cytochrome C. All of these gene sequences that you look at, they form nested hierarchical patterns. And the evolutionist universal common descent would predict that those differences are a reflection of time, divergence time. We're going to share more with a chimp because we share more of a recent common ancestor with a chimp than we do with a rabbit. But that's why the question is, are they actually the result of mutations over time? Evolutionists assume that all the DNA differences are the result of mutation over time. But the prediction that we make, and I explained it in my opening regarding the created heterozygosity hypothesis, that God would have front-loaded these functional DNA elements and units into Adam and Eve, which would apply universally across species, we predict them to be functional. Since we both predict the patterns, the nested hierarchical patterns, we both expect more similarities in a human and a chimp than we would with a human and an old world monkey or a human and a rabbit. This is just common sense, realistically. Therefore, if you can provide evidence that these are really uh, non-functional evolutionary leftovers or the result of mutations and mistakes over time, then yeah, that would be evidence for universal common ancestry. But what we find is that they are extremely functional and important to our genome. And that's why the same question I've been asking you since the beginning, you need to provide us evidence, whether it's in a technical paper or just give us an argument here as to how these retrotransposons or the pseudogenes, ALUs, whatever you want to look at, have gone from non-functional viral infections or mistakes to something incredibly functional in our genome. And I want to give you as much time as you need to just. Right. Um, well, the, how's well, that the possible? evolution is, a, is a, an extremely complex uh, system of pressures. Okay. Right. It's not a, a lot of people always think it's just one pressure that dictates how a species will evolve, but it's not. It's a, the environment of, of pressures that, pushes a species in one direction versus another. Even just seeing when we separate modern day species, we separate them for long enough in different, you know, different environments, we start to notice genetic differences based on just the simple separation of the two species. Even though they still remain in the same species and they can breed with each other and whatnot, we can begin to see ge uh, genetic changes in one species versus right. another. Okay, so the, in the evolution of a retrovirus into something that's functional and from yes. something that's non-functional that into something that's functional, it's possible due to exactly what we say in, uh, is the, the driving mechanism for evolution. Yeah, that's just story. The fact that, that it's a random mean. mutation that ultimately either was selected for or against when it comes to uh, the pressures of the environment. So in no offense, let me, let me, in other words, no answer has been given. Hey, go ahead, John. Yeah, I don't want to dominate. Go ahead, John. Quick, quick interjection here. So to me, it sounds like the logic flow you're trying to follow is if uh, the uh, What's a story Tom, Brady, so far? Tom Brady and his wife 
uh, before he got married to his wife, uh, you tried to have sex with her and she refused. Then she goes and re reproduces with Tom Brady. And then all of their people stay and only uh, procreate with NFL players and uh, Victoria's former Victoria's Secret model uh, models. And then you fast forward down and now, oh my goodness, we're seeing some differences in uh, these people. Does that mean that they are now examples of evolution? Or are they still humans that are now having existing functions expressed in a different variation? Right. Good point. Okay. And because that because that's exactly what's so, happening, and that is also exactly what is occurring in what you're trying to explain as evolution. It's not yeah. the result of new function. It's the modification of existing function, whether it be through epigenetics or through actually degradation of existing right. function or the or the maximization of. Uh, recessive genes now become dominant genes. It's, this isn't some kind of new, whole new uh, organism coming into play. We're talking about variations within existing functionality. Uh -huh. Right. Which is right. That's like that's like saying if you went and did some drag and drop on some software and you turned on okay, a so, function that you had deactivated, now you're going to say that's evolution. Or, Come on. Or, now. Okay. Okay. So here, here's what here's what we we say. All right. We say we have a a idea, a concept, a model. Okay, and this model will give us predictions that we can test. And here's what our, our, our model says. Random mutations are going to happen, and these mutations will be passed on through sexual, uh, through, through genetics, through, through right. the passing of procreation. Okay, so we can take the, just those two concepts and begin to test theories out, begin to test our data to see if it matches what our and theory how, says. And how, is that, and how is that hypothetical tested? How are you guys, how is it actually being accomplished? Is there any okay, so do you understand? Okay, do you understand? Listen, 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 made? listen, listen. Do you understand that when a retrovirus, when the ERV inserts itself, that the LTR sites on each you're side will be identical? Insertion, hold on, hold on. No, we see, no, wrong, oh, you you're incorrect. Hold on. Hold on. HIV, HIV, HIV is a fucking retrovirus virus it inserts itself into our dna this is not something new to us you do understand that the ltr sites on both sides are identical correct when they're inserted well that's a bad example because hiv so, exists hold on in all primates, hold on hold on it doesn't you exist say in that all it, humans you're, so you're saying that it, no you're up. saying that the ltr is an assumption i'm making that the retrovirus is inserting itself into the dna this is not an assertion an assumption that i'm making this is absolutely okay. genetic fact hold Let on do well, you agree or disagree? Hold be... on. Do you agree or disagree that the LTR sites on both sides of the insertion of a, of a, a retrovirus are identical? That's the first thing I want to ask you. Yes or no? The uh, Sure. It doesn't matter if they're okay. identical Great. or not. Because Great. That yes, it does. Question. Absolutely no, it does. fucking does. Because retroviruses are nothing new to us. Okay? They've been going on for millions and millions and millions of years, and we see, in, see it in our, Another assumption. In our DNA. Never seen that's, fine. Say, that's, Th fine. that's fine. You can say, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine that you don't want to accept it. That's fine that you don't want to accept it, but we see it in our I, genetics, and I've you're going to have to explain it other than to say, beginning. right, hold on. Then walk through the logic. I've started by asking you, first off, if the LTR sites were the same on each side of a retrovirus, and you started and you began to say, how do we even know that retroviruses are inserted that is intellectual dishonesty at its finest because we know for a fact that retroviruses do exist and they do insert themselves into the human genome okay that is that's how they fucking trans that's how they they expand and, and the, go from here's the thing cell is, to the cell. retrovirus well real quick let me say I have an, the thing is the retroviruses themselves could have originated from within the host genome instead of invading it from the outside because this would have had to been the case do you have any scenario. do you have any proof of that I've shown we have proof record. today. No, do you have hey, any proof that it was you. automatically you inserted? You're, you're right. Go ahead. Go ahead. You know, you're right. Let's kick it over. You right know, viruses me. are dependent upon host cells. That means that the cell's genome had to predate the viruses because if viral DNA is inserted, as you're saying, at random into the genome millions of years ago and became an endogenous retrovirus, guess what? It's more likely to disrupt existing genes. For example, a blindfolded painter is obviously going to mess up the painting he is working on by just applying random brush strokes, uh, brush strokes to it. Therefore, that's why the that's question a bad is, argument. how do yeah, these... You can't say that no, it, you can't say that it most, no, you can't say on, that it would most likely do that because our sample size is one. Well, let's, let's give him a chance to respond and then finish that point he was making. And then I promise we'll come right back to team and JL. 
Right. So my question is, is very simple. We both expect the nested hierarchical patterns and the similarities. Okay. We predict that these are functional DNA elements important to our genetics. And that's exactly what we find that they're important in regulating gene expression. They're important in the gastrointestinal tract. I mean, I provided about 15 papers. Here's a question. All of that is predicted by natural selection. One okay. Set. Well, real quick. I, I don't want to. How about you shut your difference. mouth and let us actually Hold talk? On. You've been dropping F-bombs. How about you shut it, up, John. man? Yeah, here, I'm going to ask a quick question. I want you to actually answer Fuck this, off. okay? So if we're looking at something like a DNA unit that's not consistent with a, a hierarchy, it's a question I asked in, in my opening regarding orphan genes because there's a huge problem for your your model here of animal origins is the fact that these novel DNA sequences that are highly functional exist. And guess what? They're unique traits that are associated with and appear suddenly and fully functional without any real trace of evolutionary ancestry. I asked this question to conspiracy cats in a debate the other day, and um, unfortunately, no response from him. Do you have an explanation for these? Oh, he responded to you. He responded to you, and you okay, ran so from his. You ran from his fifty-seven independent studies that he gave you of a volume of the ocean. I saw that. No, actually, so, I, I, I pointed out. Ah, uh, yeah, you didn't. Hey, hey, hey. Well, let's not argue over somebody else's debate. How about you? Sorry, one second. So, I, you're second. going order, to get order. back order. to Hold mine. On Hold on. I was making a point when he started getting away from the point, and I'm going to bring it back to the point. All right. Evolution predicts that. First off, evolution doesn't predict that the LTR sites are going to be identical. That is that is how genetics works. That's how a retrovirus inserts itself into our, our DNA. So the LTR sites at insertion are, they have to be identical. There's no arguing that they have to be. It wouldn't fit in if it didn't. It would result in a damaged DNA and it wouldn't work. So it has to be original. Now, all I'm saying is I'm not saying let's go look at the data and make up how this happened looking at the data. I'm saying let's talk about what evolution is and let's go look at the data and see if it matches our evolutionary model or not. Now, what evolution says is that random mutations from the point of insertion moving forward in time, any random mutation on one LTR will be unique to that LTR. You won't see it on one LTR and then get it on the other. Okay. So evolution suggests that, uh, that retroviruses that were inserted less f further back in time will have less of a discontinuity between the two LTR sites. And ones that are inserted further back will have more discontinuity between the LTR sites. And just like you guys were agreeing that in our hierarchy, it's humans, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, old world monkeys, right? Or th I believe that's how it is, old world monkeys after orangutans. But yeah, yeah. Uh, it, th then you should be able to go and look to, to, to see what the ratio of this discontinuity is and invalidate uh, evolution based on just that. You should be able to go and do that. But you can't because it matches up exactly with what no, we should say. We, we are going to go to Q&A soon. I'll, I'll give you a chance to respond standing for truth. And then hopefully we'll hear just a bit more from JL just to be sure that he's had plenty of uh, time to uh, contribute yes, as I'll, well as John. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, go ahead, standing for truth. I'll make one last point and then, and then um, let them take it over. So as I pointed out, the nested hierarchical patterns, the similarities in all of the biological world are expected on, on both sides. We build in homologous patterns. We also build in uh, nested hierarchical patterns. And of course, since the creation event, mutations would occur. For one, mutations are um, degrading to the organism. So mutations are not going to take your fish to fishermen. But we would expect subtle differences in these sequences that could or could not reflect the nested hierarchical patterns. That's why I pointed out to a differentiating line of, of evidence, like the orphan genes that are actually specific to particular organisms and they're fully functional without any real trace of evolutionary history. And they're also inconsistent with any real hierarchy. So I was just looking for an answer to the orphan gene. Um, yeah, so... Go but ahead, let me yeah, ask you. you let me ask that. you a question. I want to. I want to bring up. You said that um, any mutation is going to result in a degradation of the gene. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. Well, that is incorrect because the sickle cell anemia gene is a. I believe that's a remnant of a retrovirus, uh, and it, no. it or sickle cell. Uh, yeah, that's uh, it's and it's population specific to all ancestors from Africa. Sickle cell anemia past... is due to a broken, broken protein, broken cell that was caused that by an ERV. It was malaria. caused by an ERV. Let me see. 
We are okay, pretty so you, soon. So are, are you are you suggesting that something that uh, from a macro level has a degradation in function is equals a non-negative uh, mutation? Is that the point you're trying to make? No, he like said a mutation is always. Point. No, he said a mutation degrade uh, degrades the DNA. It, it does. It does. Because sickle cell no, anemia is a degradation. No, okay. the, you're you're completely no. ignoring. It, it, you're it, just, it, it, it enables the sickle cell anemia. You brought up a point. It enables a my, a slight advantage in terms of staving off malaria. And if you had things yes, like you're right. Negative, yeah, right. And and why was why did we not have that? Why do white people not have sickle cell? Why do we not have the ERV or the sickle cell anemia? Let me explain. The sickle cell. Hey, I studied that. Hey, in hang on, detail. hey, Sandy, hang on one second. Yeah, go ahead. Talk to a second. Team, I, I honestly wonder if you actually use your brain because. What are you, you fucking talking about? I literally just, just I'm, said I'm that an ER, he said right. an ERV is damaging. Right. Let him respond. We've got a, we've got Q&A oh soon. We've the, got to make this snappy. So let's get to the arguments. Just okay, so well, you time. team skeptic then, because he's interrupting me every single time. The you have a mutation that allows for a adaptation in a specific subset, but they, the, but that mutation, to your point about why do white people not have this? Well, they weren't in the same scenario needing the adaptation, which was a result, it was a degradation of genetic function in the, in the cell. And so the degradation so, hey, of the function did, yet, man. Put it back on mute. The- Fuck you. Yeah, the, that put, would you suggest that people with sickle cell anemia do not have massive, the greater risk at a, a plethora of other issues? then oh cool i'm not oh yeah sure malaria. when they're in america but not when they're in africa no in africa it helps them defend against malaria don't you think that's, that's an evolutionary us. advantage okay did you not follow the words that came out of my mouth which Jesus was they had one advantage one advantage but overall negatives There's so it got passed on it got positive passed positive on in that subset people. of population so like, and not passed on in that premise then clearly you do not have an if IQ it's not advantage Right. If it's not an advantage, if it doesn't give us an advantage, well, can I make a quick point on sickle cell? Um, People that have that mutation that cause sickle cell anemia have a broken gene, which makes a broken protein. This means that overall, this mutation is reductive. That's our point. Yeah. Why is it beneficial? They say, well, okay, people with this broken gene and broken protein, the red blood cells are defective to the point, okay, where malaria cannot thrive in the person with this condition. Therefore, they are more resistant to malaria. But guess what? The sickness associated with the, the disease results in a resistance to the malaria uh, malaria parasite due to broken cells, broken and, protein. And, and That's standing, reductive. It's not standing, taking anything forward. Stane, one insertion here. Sickle cell anemia is an inherited disease operative word uh, that affects red blood cells with an abnormal version of hemoglobin the protein okay, that carries oxygen so throughout we're gonna, the body we're going to because we let uh, both it is literally in, a disease let, because we let stand i didn't and say John it wasn't a fucking hold disease hold on one second well, you we, can't say hold but, on a second are you saying the cancer John, is a listen, positive hold on a second yeah lord man, you're stupid because as hell. we are okay it's on mute only because of so you're on mute so the point here is we gave Standing for Truth and John those last two, one, two, that one, two combo there. And then what we'll do now is give the last word over to team and JL. And then once we give, uh, once we give them the last chance to reply, we will go into the Q and a. So is it on me and JL right now? Yep. Okay. So the entire argument that, you know, that God created us all this way, and this is why we see similar ERVs and, and you know, primates, uh, why we can go and track which primate is least least uh, like us based on all these genes, and we can just say, oh, well, God just did that. Um, or we can say we can apply scientific knowledge to it, and without even without even saying, let's, let's try to, to get our evidence to support our conclusion – we can just define what the mechanism is and we can say, what should, what do we expect to see? And every time we look, we expect to see exactly what evolution predicts. We expect to see the, the ERVs in the same location as they're not fucking random. They don't just randomly select from one, you know, one genetic one. When, when we have an offspring, that ERV doesn't just move completely to a different chromosome. Uh, it's, it's going to be location specific, which is one of the ways we can use it to identify, uh, common ancestors, the and LTR to LTR. I'm sorry. Do we get a quick closing we, too? Uninterrupted? Well, I, yeah. I was thinking like last word as in like, like the last, oh, I was just doing my conclusion. I just need, I was doing my conclusion. I just need 20 seconds and then John can take the rest. So 
Um, the one thing, unfortunately, so we addressed the ERV. So, yep. So we addressed the hey, ERV. So, uh, well, hold on. Let's, I didn't know that team. Yes. Well, let's go back to team to let him finish that closing, oh, and then we'll give you sorry, a closing standing. No, I, I, I'm totally confused as to what the fuck's actually going on. Am I doing well, my outro last right word, now? By last word, I meant like the if last I, word on this, the particular issue that you guys were going back and forth on, but we can do a closing. That's That works. Let's do a closing. Okay, I'll... Um, Not you. Get... We just, I didn't, I interrupted team, so I got to let him finish that closing and then I'll, we'll come of back course. to you. My apologies, James. <laughs> no problem. Okay. So basically the entire argument is that it God all set it in motion and there's, you know, in looking beyond... Uh, what we want to find is uh, we uh, if we ever find anything that science can explain, we'll just go ahead and attribute it to God and just blow off the scientific explanation. However, we can not assume God as a per as someone like me, right? I can not assume God, and I can come to the same exact conclusions as you can based on scientific models. And then when comparing the data, the scientific, the, the modern scientific data that we can take will corroborate the model of evolution. This is done with LTR to LTR uh, ratio discontinuities, and it's done with the placement and location of ERVs. Two things that creationists will never be able to explain no matter how hard they try. Well, okay, hold on. So sorry. I've done something wrong because now standing for truth would be both starting and ending, which is not good. So what we can do is... I don't Dang even care. I'm topic. getting a closing statement. James. Oh, well, I, yeah, I, I just, I have a quick closing. I'll, I'll, I'll even set my time in less gets, than a minute. JL gets it. Why don't we do, we'll give you standing a closing or John, and then we'll go back to JL for a final closing. Yeah, I just for that need, idea, I just team. need, that was team's idea. Sure. I just need 30 seconds. I'll even put my timer on. So yeah, obviously we addressed the ERV sufficiently. He had no answer. He dodged the question the entire time. We addressed, uh, we addressed the nested hierarchies. The other thing he brought up was the chromosome two fusion. I predicted that. So I refuted it in my opening that reputed fusion site is overlapped by a functional gene. The so-called fusion site he points to is not a fusion site at all. It's uh, a functional component of that DDX 11 L2. So uh, he can look that up. There's no evidence for the cryptic centromere he talks about and no evidence for um, the vestigial telomeres. And then there's a, a satellite DNA problem. So we've uh, we've provided predictions on DNA function. We didn't even get to touch on the molecular clocks that point us right back to Adam and Eve. But I would say this was a, a good debate, but I don't think they answered any questions, including the orphan gene question. So go ahead, John. You can finish the rest of it. I mean, obviously, uh, Team Skeptic is a has some serious anger issues and also a significant IQ problem, given the fact that he can't comprehend that something that is classified as a disease would not equal a degradation in genetic function versus a positive. I mean, that just how you can even come to that conclusion and then angrily defend it uh, obviously speaks to his uh, lack of rational thinking and inability to use uh his brain to actually contemplate whether or not this crap he's spewing actually has reasonable expectation or if it's a fantasy fairy tale that gets told uh based on dramatic assumptions on oh we're going to track all this history and this lineage uh but let's not talk about or tell people what the assumptions are in our algorithms uh that we're using to supposedly prove our uh evidence beyond all doubt it, it, it's funny it's so ironic how uh, people who believe in intelligent design are accused of being the ones making things up when, uh, of course, you can make your predictions uh, have evidence if you literally argue or, or alter the, uh, the factors and the variables needed to result in the end outcome that supports your position. So hey everybody, I'm uh, going to be doing a after party over on my channel. Come over there and we'll discuss some, some of the stuff in more detail. We'll give, the last, so much, we'll give the last word to JL. And we will basically what we'll do is if anybody on any side has an after show, let us know and we can make you a mod so you can put it in the live chat and we can even put it in the description for you. And that's no matter what side you're on. So we will kick it over to JL for the very last word before the Q&A. Oh, wow. Where to begin on that? So, uh, yeah, so the, the forest of genetics and uh, evolutionary biology um, is very, very dense. And it's not typically where my my focus usually is. I'm usually focused on, you know, athe uh, theists and where they try to inject their God into the argument. Um, as far as the, the conversation that went, we never did get to the, you know, chromosome two, never did, they never did provide, you know, any 
anything to oppose that and uh, never did address the uh, the reproductive advantages of sickle cell anemia in um, African populations. Um, and they're, you know, you, they don't have a response to LTR and LTR discontinuity, but ultimately um, our, our, our opponents are bearing the lead in the respect because they're, they're creationists. They come from the, they come from a, the, this theory of throw or this hypothesis of creationism. And the problem is, is that whether the, inform you don't want to get lost in the, the, the miasma of information that you can get from genetics. But the problem is you're still inserting a creator. You're still inserting a designer at some point in there. And there is no evidence for that. So when you, create your theory and then you try to mold the facts to fit your theory that is that that's where you your problem you're inherently biased in that in, in the conclusion that you draw from that you have to have that you have to take the facts and then mold the theories to fit the facts as you come across them and that you have not done in your arguments you throw you completely throw out synergistic epistasis which facilitates the the, the uh, purging of de deleterious mutations in sexual repro reproductive populations you completely ignore the function of telomeres. And I noticed how you didn't mention it, but you did post it up in the deal that um, you have a big thing about uh, genetic entropy, which is pretty much bullshit. Uh, it's been completely debunked. It's just a, it's just a, a made up term for, uh, if I remember the, the actual scientific term is actually error catastrophe. And error catastrophe has never been uh, observed or demonstrated in a lab or in nature. So it's literally just a made up thing that, that just thrown around saying that mutations ultimately are degrading the human genome or degrading human genetics. That's all bullshit. You made a lot of false, just straight up false claims. I can't go into all of them because I have a giant list here and I'm trying to be quick for James's uh, account. But um, ultimately, the guy that you're basing all this off of, John, Dr. John Sanford's work, he was a plant geneticist. Uh, he worked with plants. He is a master's in horticulture, in, uh, horticulture. Um, and he's an, uh, an intelligent design proponent. And unfortunately, all of the papers that he constructed into Mendel's account, none of them were peer reviewed. The reason he didn't have them peer reviewed is because they were easily debunked when people looked at them. That's why he didn't put them out there. He put them in non peer reviewed uh, journals. So unfortunately, Everything you're coming out with has either been debunked or is based upon the biased conclusion that there was an inserted creator somewhere, which you have no evidence for. Even the lack of information on our half is still not evidence for a creationer or a designer or, 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 a, or a god, if you want to put that term on it. So and until you have that evidence, creationism has no foundation. We'll switch into q and want to say thanks to our speakers as today has been a rowdy one. If you... By the way, if you didn't see last night's debate, dear gosh, I didn't expect that. Uh, if anybody ever tells you that Godless philosophy Girl? isn't exciting, watch last night's debate on whether or not we can know if we exist. Never would I have guessed it would have been the way it was. So Woden Toad, thanks for your question, says, James, can we have a Young Earth versus Flat Earth debate? That would certainly be interesting. I know that Nathan Thompson wants Kent Hovind Kent Hovind is not as responsive as he used to be with us. So if there's anyone else out there, especially I think Nathan also wants to debate whether that there's a dome over the earth, let us know. Uh, I, I have a suggestion. Why don't you have Nathan Thompson and another flat earther debate these two guys? That will be a word salad that everybody <laughs> can enjoy. That would be juicy. And stupid whore energy strikes again. She says left-handed molecules can be created inside asteroids and proteins started out very small and became today's more complex proteins through duplication and fusion. Creationists. <laughs> Yeah, we didn't okay. get to my evidence for the chromosome two. We, we, I'm sure he wanted to speak a SFT. Uh, I, we didn't get to that point, man. I know that you wanted Why to talk are about it. Be talking right now. We, well, I, so I. This has we'll do to is, do. Shut the fuck up, dude. We'll Me, I'm, is, I'm talking to, to, to SFT, not to your dumb ass. I'm, all right? I'm pretty sure there's a question right, that's so, addressed towards so, us, well, not you. Well, well, no, I, I mean, technically, this is. It's, uh, I think, targeted. It's, it's meant to refute standing and John. Okay. Well. Um, what yeah, we'll after do. after John yeah, so gets again, done being butt IQ, hurt, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, right? okay, when John so gets done fucking rambling, we'll I'll ask this. SFT my uh, my relative question. What we will do is uh, we'll we'll kick it back to you for a rebuttal team. Standing for truth, John. What have you got? Stupid horror energy all up in your face. Uh, yeah. So that whole synthesis that we can't pull off in the lab. Uh, yeah, that's a problem. You've got. Uh, <laughs> Stunning improbabilities, which I think is pretty. F oh, you think that's funny, Team Skeptic? Oh yeah. Okay. okay you go go do some going. research on how they Just can't do it, it. You in the going. lab without protein, without uh, uh, ribosomes and en enzymes already existing. 
Uh, team or uh, sorry, Stanny, did you want to mention anything before we kick it over to Team for his rebuttal? Um, no, I, I think I think John covered it in great detail. So I, there's obviously no evidence for um, abiogenesis, and I think the evolutionists would even admit to that. So yeah, whatever they got to say, go ahead. Yeah, SFT, all I wanted to say was uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about chromosome 2. I have a lot of evidence for that. We'll have to get together and talk about that in the future. I felt like I could have a conversation with you, this other jackass, just can't seem to get my cock out of his mouth. Yeah, you're right. All right. Time for models only. No, no, no. There are theories for abiogenesis. We just don't know (laughs) particularly which one it is, but there is certainly no evidence to support that it was a god. I will happily have a full-scale abiogenesis only debate with either one of y'all. I, did either Time one rebuttal. of us Time did hold on, only, hold on, James. hold on, hold on, hold on. Did only. either one of us at any point tonight say that abiogenesis is a fact that we know exactly what happened? Did either one of us say that? How is that even? Why are you even All asking right. that question? Why are you fucking straw manning? Why are you straw manning? You actually have comprehension. Why are you straw manning? Apparently, you are you? Are, are you? We'll when it. I laughed, right. what did you say? When mm. I laughed, what did you say? Oh, is there? You really think there's stuff for abiogenesis? I wasn't even laughing about fucking anything that you said about abiogenesis because I can honestly sit here where, where you and I I differ, where you and I differ. Let me tell you something where you and I differ is that you can admit, you can admit that a creator is only a fictional possibility for you, that there's no evidence to support that. You can't provide me with a single piece of physical evidence. Every piece of your evidence has to be made up. But here you are. You're w- willing to debate anybody on abiogenesis, which is something most physicists then will sit there and say drop, is a possibility, and a probability, a well, we but not a guarantee. Here. I'm going to give – just because Fucking the super moron. chat was originally targeting uh, Standing for Truth and John, I'll give them the last word and we got to move on to the next one. Sure. I'll, I'll say one thing, I guess. Uh, my problem is the fact that DNA is extremely fragile. As we know, it's subject to oxidation. Oxygen destroys it. Water destroys it. The strands break. So this is not a system that's actually maintainable without a maintenance system. Therefore, you can't start with DNA because it's going to break down far too quickly. In order to maintain DNA in our cells, we need very complex repair mechanisms. And there exist different repair mechanisms for different types of problems. So what came first, DNA or the ability to maintain the DNA, which is encoded in the DNA. So it's chicken and egg problems uh, abound. Next up, Dwayne Burke, thanks for your super chat, said it's delusional to think that intelligent intelligence isn't required to assign each individual that ever lives a unique DNA code and fingerprint. I think that's uh, for you and team, uh, team and JL. I think that's a facetious question to, directed at them, to be honest. Can you re ask the question again? Yeah, no, I know, Dwayne Burke. That's directly at you, buddy. I, uh, I was like, no, they dude, said, I'd like to hear it again, please. They said it's delusional to think that intelligence isn't required to assign each individual that ever lives a unique DNA code in fingerprint. Yeah, that's. That that's feels like a troll question. Yeah, that's. That's. that's the, somebody's asking a facetious, facetious yeah. question for them. Facetious. I know we well. I know him personally, so that's why the only reason why I think he's being sincere. I, like, oh, I know okay. The well, uh, that's exactly what fucking uh, evolution would predict. That in fact, evolution would predict that each one of our DNA is slightly different than every other person out there. Gotcha. And thanks for your super chat from Stupid Horror Energy strikes again. She says. Quote, it has been established that a decrease in the number of chromosomes by two in humans is a result of the fusion of two autosomes, unquote. That is a quote from a paper published this year. It hasn't been overturned. I think that's for you, Standing for Truth, and John. Yeah, I mean, we could do an entire, I mean, I've had entire debates on the chromosome two fusion. I'd love to, we could have a respectful discussion on that with, um, team skeptic i mean just even forgetting about the uh, degeneracy of the area the lack of evidence for cryptic centromere the function of it i just have one quick question that um the fact and i have a paper here i I provided it in my opening that chimps have very distinctive and very large satellite sequences at the end of their chromosomes but they're absent in man and guess what? These large ape-specific satellite sequences should be seen flanking the reputed fusion site on both sides if there really was a fusion and if we really are related to apes. But guess what? They're not there. They're absolutely absent. So I'd like an answer to that. I think that's an important question, and I don't believe an answer has been provided. Therefore, it has been overturned. So, 
Let's get to the next one. Smokey Saint, thanks for your super chat. Said after show, LPPs, namely John Maddox, Logical, Plausible, Probables channel, open mic in all caps. Next up, thanks for your super chat from Angel Gray. Said, need, need evidence for creation. Need evidence for creation? Yes, special creation. <laughs> Is there I any? Spent, I spent... Uh... You know, seven minutes providing predictions regarding speciation rates. We didn't get to get um, into that, unfortunately. Still not evidence blocks. for a creator. It's evidence that you don't understand how something happens. And and you're you're you God didn't listen to all the opening You guys don't understand because uh, there were lack of answers to the questions I gave. But I pointed out that the gold standard of science is uh, testable predictions. And we're doing it in uh, molecular clocks and the mitochondrial DNA. Uh, the book of Genesis tells us that God created two people, Adam and Eve. Therefore, we can make predictions. And the predictions that we're making are coming true. And that's the gold standard of science. Evolutionists are making predictions. Creation wins. So, there so the go. Bible is a science textbook. That's what you're asserting. No, but we can read the Bible and the account of uh, human origins in Genesis. And we can say, okay, let's see if we can make accurate predictions and retrodictions. And it turns out that we have, and evolutionists aren't doing it. Evolutionists are not making predictions in mitochondrial DNA. The mitochondrial DNA takes us back 6,000 years, and the mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome are nothing like chimps. So, so that's the Judeo Christian faith. The Judeo the, 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 Christian So Genesis. the suppositions, so the presuppositions of the Judeo Christian faith are paramount in determining science. No, but that's the, what you're asserting. The gold standard, there's two models here, but a lot of lines of evidence are agnostic to the debate. Therefore, when we look to the differentiating lines of evidence, like molecular clocks, DNA function, we are making predictions in those types of um, sciences. And guess what? The evolutionists aren't, for example. And yeah, but the problem is you're still basing your argument, you're still basing your conclusions upon what you've read in the Bible, that you're going to the Bible. You're, you're basically taking the Bible, which is a subjective book that can be interpreted in a myriad of ways, and you're driving your conclusions from those. Okay, but the Bible so differs response, from, other, from other original, from other uh, texts. So, okay, so this so response which one is, that you're making is indicative of the fact that you don't actually know what the heck you're talking about in regards to our arguments, and that the just because... No, I'm questioning your use of the Bible in determining no, I, anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Going and figuring out whether or not something exists in terms of evidence for an intelligent agent and then extrapolating it back. I mean, I'm not sure, sure how it's any different than doing uh, evolutionary no, but, you know, research going you know, back to the foundational premise the book. of ultimately, Darwin. You're asserting the book Come on now. No, the, you're, yeah, so no, you guys go back to Darwin as your original You are asserting the so book now. is evidence of your creator. I didn't bring up Darwin. Glory, we will go to the next Hey, one. hey, I didn't bring up Darwin one fucking time, and we have Neanderthal mitochondrial he, DNA he brought, that dates back further than 6,000 years. No, 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 yo, you're asserting that, you know, you're going back to the Bible because you're asserting that the Bible is evidence for your creator, and it is not. The Bible is just a book. I have a paper here Done. that shows that okay. Neanderthals. You, sorry, you guys are some of the dumbest people so I've ever. And all you can all respond right. with is, is all you can respond right. with are right. attacks to our intelligence. Well, that's a good point. That's all you've got. Is we are going to go to the next question. I think that because that super chat was originally for, it was for us. Oh, that was, was for, for us. yeah. So go ahead if you want to have the last word, and then we'll go to the next one. Yeah, um, my last word would be if those predictions and retrodictions that flow from a literal interpretation of Genesis were shown to be falsified, then we'd have to rethink the model. But it just turns out that the molecular clocks, the genetic diversity found in uh, people around the earth uh, just so fits an origin of just two people, Adam and Eve, and the evolutionists had to invent post hoc, ad hoc rescue devices with their hypothetical population bottleneck and out of Africa. So we're the ones doing the next. science and they're the ones doing the non-science. No, you're not. Uh, no, you're not. JPP right, next one. 3030, right. thanks for your question, said, do any of the authors of the papers standing for truth, cites, agree with him on anything he said in his opening? Yes. Gotcha. Next. Stupid whore energy strikes again. This time she says, <laughs> we don't expect big differences between populations, except where there has been local selection for different genetic variants. I think this is for you, Standing for Truth, and John. Yeah, whoever wants to take that one, John, you or myself. Sorry, sorry read the question again. Next uh, let's see. That question was, we don't expect big differences between populations except where there has been local selection for different genetic variants. Um, 
Well, I know by rule we see, for example, we can look at the paper that I pointed out in the opening, I wish we would have been able to talk about where it suggests that uh, over 90% of species originated at the same time uh, with modern humans. When you can look at even the CO1 gene, that highly conserved subset of a mitochondrial DNA protein, and you'll find less differences within species and more differences between species. So these nested hierarchical patterns exist. And those differences, the evolutionists will say, are markers of time and divergence time. And creationists would predict that those differences are there for functional purposes. So we're making the predictions. They're on paper. And um, it seems that those differences are there for functional reasons. So well, that's my answer. So why are there no mammal energy, so why are there no Stupid mammal whore energy has another response. She says, standing for truth, <laughs> not sure what you're talking about. Chromosome 2 also has satellite sequences, not only at both ends, but also in the middle. No, yep. she, yes, yeah, uh, stupid whore energy thinks I'm using a different argument about how telomere to telomere fusions, every fusion observed in nature, in nature has uh, satellite DNA. I'm talking about the Ventura paper. Um, you know, I'm not sure if uh, stupid whore energy has read it, but uh, the paper itself actually says that the um, presence of um, abundance amounts of chimpanzee specific sub telomeric satellite DNA sequences are absent in humans. So I've discussed this with Ruhef through email. He's studied this topic um, in great detail and he admits it's not there. The question is, why isn't it there? Um, we'll have to debate that at a time in the future. So stupid whore energy has yet another response. She Whoa. says chromosome two fusion site is degenerate because the high mutability of telomere repeats. It's normal. Yeah. Um, what's funny about that is those telomere ick like motifs that are actually found there. Yeah. They're degenerate. And yeah, they say that it should be because it's highly mutable and it happened 6 million years ago, but guess what we found, um, we found, and I've got papers, um, showing this, that those sequences are involved in e expression. They're, they're functional DNA elements and they're found elsewhere in the genome, not even associated with chromosome fusion. So it's a double whammy for us. I know they have the rescue device, but that's what uh, refutes that rescue device. Good question though. Next up, Henrik Simonson, thanks for your question, said, just like a snowball rolling down a hill is not a product of chance, but a product of gravity. John Maddox needs to demonstrate why life is a product of chance or drop his silly calculations. <laughs> Oh, okay. Yeah, come over to the live stream and we'll have you on and I'll give you a little education on why that question is quite possibly one of the stupidest things of the night. And that's saying something given the fact that we've been debating Team Skeptic and uh, the lunacy that comes All out right. of his mouth. Let's get to the next question. I found your, I found those numbers you threw up to be hilarious as well. Ilya, oh, they're well accepted, they're well accepted you're premises. Fucking, Ilya, you don't understand well accepted premises. anything. James, you don't if understand. Basic math, buddy. Any if I may, really, really fast. Sure. I'm still kind of curious. I'm still kind of curious as to. He said that all that that it was stated that you guys stated that all species came up together. That we came up together to the, the, your whole like young Earth creationist bullshit and everything. That's so right. why are there no mammalian fossils found in the Devonian strata? Um, well, if, well, now we're getting into a totally different argument with the fossil record, but you just completely dodged the paper that suggests, based on the highly conserved CO1 gene, that there's low genetic diversity in this mitochondrial. Uh, DNA protein. It's it, what they're doing is they're looking at a subset of a subset of mitochondrial DNA. There's low genetic diversity across the entire biological world, suggesting that uh, all of biological life came into existence at the same time with humans. I'm not sure if you've read the paper. If you haven't, there's no point in in um, commenting on it. But that's you ever heard exactly of extinction? Expect from Genesis. Have you, have you ever heard of extinctions? Right. That's like what they a, resort to. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So in the paper, they, and that's good. Do too, we not experience extinctions, that. but do we not ex experience extinctions here in our modern history, history that can be confirmed by multiple reliable sources that we can, you know, follow like the, uh, the, the possession of the evidence, you know what I'm saying? Like we can follow it that back to the original person who made the prediction or made the observation. I mean, can we not agree that we do observe extinctions going on every year? We can see that uh, the cheetahs are experiencing a huge bottleneck. They're down to like 7,000. Yeah, extinction events are real. And when you read this paper, that's what they say. They say, you know, we fought the evidence as hard as we could. And what they did was they invented a near extinction event uh, 
I think 200,000 years ago, just based on geology, not actual observed mutation rates or genetic diversity, uh, to explain the, the, the low genetic diversity. But what's funny is uh, our starting point would be a, a Genesis flood 4,500 years ago. There's your extinction event. <laughs> uh, sorry, eroded sorry. genetic diversity. That's exactly what we see in this. I'm sorry. I just find it incredibly telling. Sorry, I find it incredibly telling. Sorry, I find it incredibly telling. Sorry, I find it incredibly telling. We've got many, many questions. I hate to do this, but we do have to keep moving. We have another. I didn't interrupt you. Ilya Moon thinks we have to yeah. keep moving. I hate to do it, <laughs> but it's just telling that we have, have many questions. So I do have to keep moving. Yeah, we do have a fun. lot of questions. So Ilya Moon, and also criticism for me now. Ilya Moon, thanks for your uh, friendly feedback. Says more skeptics need wrenches. Just saying. Well, we will definitely do that, Ilya. If it's out of balance, our goal is to have like a roughly equal amount, and so our goal is to have like. As long as they're responsible moderators, not insulting people in the chat, we're happy to have them regardless of their view. So thanks for that feedback, Ilya Moon. Ashketit, thanks for your statement question, says vestigial organs? I'm not sure if they're, I'm not sure who that's for. Do you guys know? I think it was directed at JL. JL actually uh, said it was vestigial DNA, not true. He was just making uh, the distinction between trash DNA and junk DNA and vestigial DNA. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, what's funny is Hold when on, it comes standing, to I the... I to do it, but just standing... I gotta well, keep, let me just make one going. point real quick. Hold on. No, this one's even for you. Stupid whore <laughs> energy. <laughs> thanks for your... Why doesn't she just debate me live? <laughs> she says there's a world of difference between all sequences have function quote unquote and some subset of all sequences have function right so uh what one thing that's good is is uh, stupid whore energy is is putting our kids through college with all these super chats uh but uh, oftentimes they'll downplay the function um so for example encode has revealed that over 80 percent of our genome is actively transcribed into um, RNA. Now, we don't know exactly what every single uh, genetic sequence does. That's why we've made testable predictions. They're on print, they're in paper that uh, based on genetic knockout tests, we will um, find out in the future. And the thing is, we understand so little of the, of the DNA language. We're discovering more and more every day. But once we do these genetic knockout tests, we'll find out exactly what these sequences um, are doing. But we, we do know that there's at least preliminary evidence for over 80% of uh, our genome being active to some extent. So it's, it's fascinating times right now. Well, and, and one, uh, one expansion to that point too, oh, short and pithy. Uh, they're also now discovering that the things they thought were non-functional, even through knockout experiments, uh, they're realizing that there's, oh wait, turns out there's a difference in what actually gets expressed in terms of in vivo versus in vitro uh, experimentation. Gotcha. And thanks for your question from, let's see. Stupid whore energy says if you spam a genome with a couple million copies of any random DNA sequence, some of them will be functional. For example, if it got dropped in gene regulatory regions, the function response to TEs is a red herring. So um, I've never heard of this stupid whore energy before, but it's good that she's asking a question. I'm just kidding. So she's triggered. <laughs> yeah. So the, like John. So now she's out. triggered. I'm triggered. Jail Warren's triggered. Everybody's triggered, but you, right, John? Dude, you've been obviously triggering, triggering going on. You've been obviously <laughs> triggered all night. It's been fun. You, you ever know, heard that? You ever heard the saying? Game, so. It's not me. It's you. Yeah, that's Dude, who is literally dropping f bombs throughout the entire debate and telling. Do you think I fucking care about a fucking f bomb? You fucking that's idiot! Point, oh, no, I fucking triggered, don't. Bro. You can't even. I call this question. I <laughs> speak like this all the fucking time, John. So I speak like this all the fucking time. time. I do apologize, that's 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 SFT. We're jump hey, I apologize, you. SFT. Oh Go no, ahead. that's okay. This is fun. This is one to remember. Oh, my kids are up. Um... We must my, move quickly. My son's first word is going to be the F word. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> I've dropped no F bombs, and you still haven't answered any of my questions. So, irregardless, I feel like he said questions. you were triggered too, Jail. And okay, let me just let me really. just answer this question real quick. So, uh, the retro transposons, even the ALUs, there's a lot of classes of these retro transposons. I find evolutionists oftentimes point to just the ERVs, but uh, let's let, for example. Um, the ALUs, they represent a pervasive and active class of these um, DNA elements. But guess what? If these weren't all functional, if they really were just all junk, 
well, then they should be slowly mutating to oblivion. And the fact that we see so many highly conserved regions that are being maintained by selection shows that these really are highly functional because it would be a significant uh, waste of energy and time for the cell to transcribe and um, worry about all of these uh, gene sequences and DNA elements. So I think the evidence is strong that the vast portions of our genome are functional. It's not just spurious transcription, if that's what stupid whore energy is hinting at, but uh, that's all I got to say. James, may I speak on this for just one second? Just a, it's a sure. positive refutation sure. Sure. for that. Sure. Um, okay, so when you have something that's in the, the DNA, when you have a sequence that's in the DNA, to remove that sequence, let's say it's a non-functional sequence of the DNA, to remove that sequence requires energy. Okay, it requires energy to continuously, just like it requires energy to, in, to uh, integrate new DNA or make changes, it all requires energy. So if the expenditure of energy to get rid of the non-functional DNA exceeds its ability to like keep it function, to keep it at a uh, reproductive level, like to keep its reproductive functioning up, uh, whether that be through speed, um, through genetic mutation, like a, a, a physical mutation, whatever the case may be, it's got to take the energy away from somewhere else to remove that, that DNA. So it becomes more efficient to just leave the non-functioning DNA in or more energy efficient to leave the non-functioning DNA in than to remove the non-functioning DNA. Next. Right, so I would just say that, I guess, is it, since it's my question, do I have last word? That's James? fair, yeah. Uh, so th that would assume that they really are non-functional because that's more of like a philosophy and an explanation for the data that we see. Now, the thing is, is it actually reasonable? And this is what they'd have to prove to us. Is it reasonable for us to believe that all of these so-called ancient viruses and ancient parasites possess the genetic information necessary to promote so many genetic functions and so many biochemical functions in human beings? I don't think it's reasonable, plausible, or probable. There you go, John. <laughs> Max up. Keeping moving. Second best, Bob, thanks for your statement, said, I'm really way too stupid to understand most of this, but I'm listening anyway, uh, mostly because I love the people up here. Thanks for your kind words, second best, Bob. Uh, you are loved. And next up, Smokey, <laughs> Smokey Saint, thanks for your Smokey. super chat, said, uh, let's see, denying overwhelming evidence of design when you make a career demanding acceptance of evidence for round earth. Team Skeptic, uh, let's see. How do I clean this up? I disagree with you. <laughs> they only called you an idiot, but I was still like, oh, gosh. Oh, you can call me an idiot. I don't care. Uh, what, what, what was the original uh, question? Because it kind of seemed like a statement more than a question. You bet. They said denying overwhelming evidence of design when you make a career demanding acceptance of evidence for round earth. Well, I would argue that that person's de definition of evidence is different than my definition of evidence. My definition of evidence requires something solid behind it, not just a, hey, look, I don't understand how this should work, and I think it should work this way, and here's a bunch of papers that I kind of read through without having a true education or understanding about what they're talking about, and I came to these conclusions, and that's my evidence. Now, I don't mind. People can, I, I'm not an evolutionary biologist. I'm not a microbiologist. Most of this stuff I've learned over the past couple of weeks in preparation for this debate so that I could be educated for myself. I didn't want to come in here blind and just try to bullshit it because I asked for evidence. The majority of my, uh, my research went into uh, seeking out pieces of evidence and setting those aside. And I do still have a lot of evidence here. We just never got to the parts where uh, we really, I could present anything that, I mean, the, the, like, like SFT was saying that the chromosome two, that's a huge part. I like speaking on chromosome two more than I like speaking on ERVs because chromosome two really shows a, dist a, a distinct tie to a common ancestor with the, uh, gorillas, uh, apes, chimpanzees. Uh, and that's why, you know, it, it it's. We could have gone in that. I had more more evidence to provide for that, but I didn't see any evidence come from them that was substantiary. Next up, thanks for your... I don't think I read this from Stupid Whore Energy yet, so she says... Did, let me know if I did read this one. If you spam a genome with a couple million copies of any random DNA sequence... You, did you read that one. You read that one. Oh, that's embarrassing. Okay. Next up, thanks for your... <laughs> she your... has been overloading you, James. It's fair. Yes. She's gotten confused. Brian good. Stevens says, if you want to live in a bubble, block everyone. I So for those of you who have been debating, I don't know if you know, but in the live chat, there was a little 
controversy because I I de wrenched Nathan Thompson, your your best friend, Ooh. team skeptic, uh, because well we want our mods, we asked them to be friendly, and so it's long story. Nathan started telling everyone hey. that he was going to block them individually from his own accounts. So. Hey, SFT, SFT, I have a question. Do you have a picture of me and a mankini on your phone? <laughs> and a mankini? Yeah. No, I don't believe so. Nathan Thompson <laughs> does. He keeps a picture of me and my mankini on his phone. I literally think I'm his best friend on those lonely nights when he's sitting in his car trying to go to sleep. I really think that about 95% of those nights he's talking to me. He whips his phone out, looks at me, and is like, hey, Team Skeptic, how's it going? Very you nice. Have a lovely relationship. You never do know. I mean, next up, thanks for your question from Stupid Whore Energy Strikes Again. She says, the amniotic egg and hair creates a nested hierarchy that includes primates and rodents slash rabbits. This fits genetics. It fits the fossil record, etc. There's nothing like this in your quote-unquote model standing for truth. Uh, that's why I pointed to a number of lines of evidence that can differentiate between the nested hierarchical patterns that we see in the biological world. For example, orphan genes, uh, the DNA function, the molecular clocks in the uh, mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome. Uh, getting into the fossil record, yeah, that'd be a whole uh, separate debate, of course, but we see a lot of stasis. Uh, we see a lot of uh, incongruencies in, in the fossil record as well. And I think the fossil record can be explained best by the flood and, and a burial by ecosystems, habitats, and communities. So that's exactly what we see. Sea creatures at the bottom and, and land animals and mammals near the top and birds as well. So uh, it's not uh, an argument against our position, of course. So John, if you had something to add. No, that was, uh, short, that was good. Short. Good response. Three. Thanks so much. Probably my favorite super chat of all. We love Steve McRae, but I can't help but read it. From Steve McRae's manager, basically, I doubt this is his real manager, says, my client <laughs> would like to debate the definitions of a restraining order and a non-disclosure agreement. Can you make that happen, James? Very provocative. I don't know what's going on with Steve. I know that there's like some sort of controversy, and I think it... I, you know, all it's, a, it's always... Steve will always keep you on your toes. We hope he's doing well, and I really mean that. So, next, thanks for your... Question from Anti, is it, let me know if I mispronounced this, Anti Hirvenselo, they asked, most important question of the night, why are James and Team Skeptics such sexy beasts? Thank you. Appreciate oh that. Oh my God. Because we, we work, don't we, James? We, we work on it. We definitely work. Hey, you paid you them to say sexy? that. Okay. The only reason, <laughs> I join, only reason I joined them on this thing. That's fine. I appreciate it. And Kent Hovind's CPA, I doubt this is the real Kent Hovind's accountant, said, if evolution is true, why do we still have Hovind's? Oh, come on. <laughs> okay, next up. Thanks Sorry. for Slip your... that one by, yeah. <laughs> Smokey Saint, thanks for your, your super chat, said, Team Skeptic, oh, snap, coming at you. says, Team Skeptic is an embarrassment to skepticism. Yeah, they all say that. Anybody that disagrees with me says that. But what they don't understand is like, what they think skepticism is is just going against whatever the whatever whatever the modern uh, modern fucking the the current pa uh, paradigm is. That I must go against that to be a skeptic. So like right now, I'm a globe earther, right? How can I be a globe earther and still be a skeptic? Because the Earth, they, the NASA says the Earth is round. So I'm not a skeptic because I believe NASA be, when they say the Earth is round. However, it's not skepticism is about holding a belief until there's evidence to support the belief. I don't. I never held a belief on evolution. I I probably thought that it was uh, it was true growing up. But when I got to be an adult and I got to start thinking about it for myself, I've done my own research and looking into it. And from the research that I've done, the, the scientific papers that I've read, the, the evidence that I was here to present tonight, it all points towards uh, to, my skepticism should be on things that go against evolution, not evolution itself. That would just be me being a denialist. And want to do a quick reminder before we read more questions. All of the speakers are linked in the description. So want to be sure everybody knows that. If you want to hear more of these guys, you can hear more by conveniently clicking those links. And Adam L. Sub to J.L. Warren. Sorry. <laughs> Wait. Oh, wait, I think I've got J.L. Oh, yeah, I've got him in there. And J.L. or Adam L. Bilia, thanks for your statement, said, 
standing for truth, I don't agree with you, but I respect you and your conduct. Evolutionist, I agree with you, and I respect you and most of your conduct. John, I don't agree with you. F you and your conduct. <laughs> you know, I always find it funny how atheists uh, get so triggered when you actually call them out and for their crap. And then the things they're doing to you and you call and you give them a response, uh, suddenly it is, ir you know, it's just horrible behavior. How could anybody ever do this? It's like, oh, wow, you can't handle getting what for? Shocking. You haven't called atheism out on anything. Soy boys. You haven't called atheism out <laughs> on anything. That's, Sorry. It's like my, okay, next up, thanks for your, let's see, statement from Tiffany Bear says, you've got fans out there standing for truth and John says, creation for the win. Next up, D6, thanks for your question for the creation side. Coming on strong says, you cited a lot of scientific publications in this debate. How many authors agree with your position? Many of them. I'm going to have to keep my answer short and sweet because it's getting dinner time and the kids are getting, uh, it's been a few, a couple hours. So many of them is my answer. I'm so sorry, bro. We'll try to get, we're going to move fast. Bartos Diagos. And if you have to leave and want to have John answer all your questions, I'm sure the audience would love to hear more of John. So John, I love you, John. Come on. Okay. Can Bart I, can I make a John's point though? Boy. I don't want to be, I don't want to make a rude point about this, but I do want to make a point. Um, when you cite sources that, uh, that are like creation sources to, to use in a creation argument, it's kind of like, it, it kind of makes it hard to set, to agree with those sources, to find those sources reputable. If you found sources that were against you or had nothing to do with the argument itself, and you use those sources, like if you used a normal biologist or someone who believes in evolution, let's say, if you were to use his sources against against the argument of evolution, that would hold a little bit more credence. But to use creation-based arguments in a creation uh, versus evolution uh, debate is a bit, you know, it just doesn't. Well, do you know the ratio? Well, do you know, the ratio? That well, do you know the ratio of creationist papers versus just secular publications I showed in my opening? Because there were a lot. A of John, John, do you not think that creation papers are already going to have a bias towards creationism? Yes or no? Do you not think that evolutionary paper uh, can have a bias I towards evolution? I However, didn't necessarily I cite is, evolutionary papers. I the cited the presence of ERVs. That's biology. Who are questioning That's not evolutionary evolution. models? Do you understand that people who are evolutionary biologists and molecular biologists are sure the evolutionary model evolution itself? Sure, so sure. The really evolutionary sure how okay. Your, how your in science, in science, we have a have we have a best understanding with the in science like, oh, we have, have a best understanding. Whatever your listen, is. listen. <laughs> right. Here's the answer hey, so to your you fucking question. Have you become a modern flat earther? No, I fucking I make fun of idiots like you and them you all the time. Okay, cool. No, you yeah. you're a fucking That's you're a creationist that is essentially a flat earther. Since it was my question. So here's the thing. I find um evolutionists they don't know how to read a paper and then come to their own conclusion they've got that pre um existing assumption at play so for example all the pedigree based studies that i um presented from secular sources the observed mutation rate okay the empirical method takes the mitochondrial uh, dna ancestor just back six thousand years now when you look at the entire paper you see the evolutionists questioning it. You know, the authors of the paper, they say, oh, well, you know, this doesn't line up with deep time evolution. Therefore, now they go over a number of methods and a number of ways to calibrate the observed rate with the deep time assumption. So as creationists, we don't need to do that. We're looking at these papers and saying, wow, the empirical rate fits perfectly with our predictions and expectations. Why would we now calibrate it with the deep time evolutionary assumption? That makes zero sense but evolutionists can't get past their we must move bias. To the next we must move well, to the next one we've got many questions guys i know that you've got a response and i'm so sorry to cut you off but also because i'm over we're over time we've got just we had a huge influx of questions is i, I know that you got a round in the chamber ready to fire at standing for truth and i understand the desire to to fire so many rounds into his well, you body. spent longer you <laughs> spent longer explaining that than what i needed to say but go ahead i just want to know why none of those papers are peer reviewed because they aren't. They are peer. Every single paper I present. No, they're not. Be no, they're not. Because yes, if they're they peer are. reviewed, yes, they, they get are. refuted. They're all peer reviewed. They're all Sorry. peer reviewed. Stop. Parts, you can have a one on one debate. Too. Dude, you know you guys haven't even read them and, you, and you're making assumptions? Wow. Don't have any <laughs> level next of preconceived up, notions? Next Good up. Lord. Go back Bartos. and rewatch the debate. Okay, we seriously have to keep moving. Papers. Bartos. Okay. 
Uh, team, if you have a really short, because they just let that run for way longer. Team, if you have nah, a short, I'm good, man. Okay. Bartos Diagos, thanks for your question. Why does God make it so that people in Africa have something against malaria, but have to sacrifice other things? Does this does not make sense to me? I think they're talking about, like, on a creation view, like, why is it that God allows this protection? I think they're against questioning malaria? the sickle, sickle cell anemia. Or sickle cell, and yeah. But then you have these other deficiencies because of sickle cell. So it's for creationists. It's for you guys. You want that one SFT? You want me to take it? You can take it if you want, brother. It's up to you. I mean, I'll be short and sweet. You finish the follow up. The I mean, uh, one component of all this is there's examples that are the exact same logic in. The, it's not just oh, it's only people in Africa that have any kind of uh, insert whatever we're talking about here. Now, obviously, in the context of what we've talked about in regards to uh, genetic entropy, which you supposedly who have obviously not written or read peer-reviewed papers think nobody actually views as happening, uh, JL. It's um, not. It's actually happening. No, and, it's not. Oh, really? It's, so it's, you think it's Fisher's a bu- theorem has no, been, gen- been Genetic debunked? entropy is okay. a bullshit term. Yeah, oh, okay. It okay. is. Well, maybe you should go read some papers from medical it's researchers. Would you like, would you like, me, to, would you like me to pull up the info? Would you like me to pull, I have the information right here that refutes it. It's right really, in front of me. Oh, oh, you realize really? Dr. John Sanford just spoke at the NIH, right? The National Dr. John Sanford is a fucking plant scientist, okay? Next up, I have the information right yeah, here. Go in front look of me at his on my technical screen. publications okay. versus okay. how many technical publications you've got. Given that, error catastrophe so has never been observed or documented we, in nature listen, or just experimentally. You don't genetic entropy, that's I your problem. Everybody's not passion, genetic entropy, there is, must, genetic entropy is just another bullshit term for error catastrophe. We'll give, we'll give the last word. We'll give the last word to creation uh, guests, and then we'll move to the next one. I got to give them the last word because I don't want to gang up on them because the super chat was for them. So go ahead, Donnie. I mean, um, Johnny. And we'll then move on to the next one. Oh, all I got to say is uh, apparently we have some extremely triggered atheists over here who are going into panic meltdown, even though there's so you, research from medical question, researchers. You address who the question for me. Just because... I, 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 am, I am addressing it. There are plenty of medical researchers that are publishing papers this year talking about this exact subject. So go to Nature Cellular and go do some basic searching and you'll find out that I'm correct. Next. No, you're not. We have two, two different <laughs> ones. We have... Mitchell, thanks for your statement, says, Pond scum to people is a fairy tale. We also have John Rapp, I think this is a response, says, Creation is a retrofitted fairy tale. Pseudoscience. Yeah. Next up, thanks for your question from Lily R.O. Says, the John guy is easily triggered. P.S. James, <laughs> James is a nine. Thank you, Lily R.O. I, don't, I always think Lily R.O. is secretly Earl the Postman from Alabama, but I'll take what I can get. So thank you. And John, if you want to respond to that, apparently you're easily triggered. Apparently so. When I call people out for uh, being assholes, I know Next. it's, tr- it's triggered. Right, yeah, you ever? Do you ever notice that maybe you call everyone else an asshole? That Did you're you... the asshole, uh, and everybody yeah, so else is the good person. You, I'm pretty yeah, sure if you go eat back and shit, stop bitch. suffering from amnesia, then maybe you'd recognize that I responded eat to you being a jerk. Shit, you still have provided no evidence for shit. anything that, okay. you've, that you've claimed. <laughs> We have to move to the next one. What is it? Let's see. Um, My assertion about Team Skeptic is very accurate. The only, we, the reason <laughs> we, we, we have to keep the answers constrained to the questions because otherwise I can't blame other people for wanting to respond to direct insults toward them. So Huge R is thanks for your question. Says, if these guys are supposed to be Christians, then why would anyone ever want to be one? Bad witness, guys. You too, Nathan Thompson. <laughs> next, thanks for your Super chat question from Nephilim Free says, secular genetics databases acknowledge that the, quote, fusion site, unquote, codes for polymerase and specifies cell type. The information spans the, quote, unquote, site, LOL in all caps. Crickets. I think that, I think, okay, well, Andreas Elda, thanks for your question says what's intelligent about giraffe laryngeal nerve i don't know what that one is that the like super long one i don't know next question next i was on mute oh, no go ahead that, that's fine just if you want to just get through them go ahead stupid whore energy strikes once again saying standing for truth not sure what you're talking about chromosome 2 also has satellite sequences i think i said actually i did read that yeah, you read this one 
Thanks for your super chat. <laughs> Ilya Moon says, Evolution is proven. The Bible is not. Hashtag Hail Sagan 666. Yeah, e evolution is at, at this point pretty much dead. They're not making any testable predictions <laughs> uh, in genetics, for example. The ENCODE researchers, these evolutionary scientists at NIH, they ignore the critics that try and hold on to that junk DNA paradigm. Karar himself said if ENCODE is right, evolution is wrong, and uh, genetic degeneration is real. We accumulate 100 new mutations per person per generation, and JL here has never provided us with the type of selection that can remove so many deleterious mutations. He only provides insults, and insults Dr. John Sanford. Those are, are you not kidding me? Synergistic, synergistic epistasis removes that. Oh, did you Google that? What is synergistic epistasis? Go ahead. Synergistic Define. epistasis facilitates the purging of deleterious mutations in sexual populations. Oh, did you just read that right? Okay, yeah, no, no. In your earlier argument, argument buddy, hey, this is coming from the two guys. You said they did all the research in the last two weeks. You just dismissed that completely. Oh no, I I talked about synergistic epistasis. No, you threw it out. You said it was thoroughly debunked. falsified. Synergistic epistasis speeds up the degeneration problem. Dan Grar didn't even mention synergistic epistasis when he was trying to refute ENCODE. He tr he actually resorted to the junk DNA paradigm, so those mutations can be absorbed by the neutral junk. Synergistic epistasis, nobody uses that argument. Humans are not getting better. Face the facts. Want to quickly remind everybody, in case you want to uh, try to poke him and trigger him, Nathan Thompson is still in the chat. <laughs> Fuck oh, Nathan, Nathan I love you, buddy. Do you remember Team? You met him in person, Team. You guys were, like, hugging and stuff, and it was everybody was married. Oh, fucking shit. I didn't <laughs> know. <laughs> hey, James, let's get it right, Okay. All that shit that kid little that little kid talked, and then he saw me in Dallas and got scared as fuck of me as, as fuck for me when we were at the fucking uh, Flat Earth International Conference. And then we went and had that debate, and and at, then after the international conference, he said shit like, "Next time I see Team Skeptic, I'm just gonna twist him up." What the fuck did he do the entire time? He sat in his chair like a quiet little boy. Good well, job, Nathan. Well, Good Sydney job, Natalie. Hug. I can't remember. End no, I didn't hug. Are you kidding me? You know how fucking stinky he looks? Oh, my God. <laughs> hey, you know, if Nathan I want to hug Nathan no, Thompson, Nathan. I'll go to – if I want to hug Nathan Thompson, I'll go oh. to a fucking anthropological museum and hug a fucking skeleton because so, that dude looks no. – when people say I look okay. like Skeletor, no, no. he looks like my skinny fucking little bitch boy. No. He, people Nathan, say that I'm you have one. an enchanting musk, Nathan. Don't take that seriously. <laughs> Flat Earth, thanks for your message. Says message for Nathan Thompson. Uh, for real, this is a real super chat that coincidentally or not came in right now. And Flat Earth said message, and this is by right now. It comes up right now on the list. So this was said like probably 20 minutes ago. Said Nathan, you're a coward and you need help. Sorry, Nathan, I have to read it. Okay, next up, Nad Kubik, thanks for your question. Statement says, disproving evolution is not a positive claim for creation. Team, please school them about positive evidence. Positive evidence requires positive claim. I mean, posit positive claims require positive evidence. You got to have something to back what you're saying up other than I don't think that your model is possible. Next the model up. of evolution is, a, is extremely uh extremely like has so many variables that apply to it you got sexual selection natural selection artificial selection you have all these different pressures that are going to influence each individual little jump from dna from step to step on the dna process and eventually those little jumps will result in such a difference that two species yeah can't and how do you how do you explain moving. codon There's syntax the storyboard shift. again <laughs> how do you explain codon syntax uh frame shift okay you've asked a question in between uh, protein or and, and then we have to move on to the next thing that's a deflection you still have no that's a direct next question up. that's being asked don't by researchers buddy better. no you still haven't provided evidence worse. for your creator next up uh, that, that's uh, a deflection we've given you plenty we, we actually did our opening no, statement you which you guys dodged next up um john rap says why did god make old earth and fossils no sense I think it's for you, John. Okay, that question has a built-in assumption. Why did God make an old earth and fossils? Fossils require rapid burial. But we can save that for another day. Next up, Shreedit, thanks for your super chat. said, Stay, uh, stupid whore energy, get on a live stream and debate standing for truth if you're yes. so confident. Next up, we, we, Justin Johnson, thanks for your <laughs> question, said, message for John, how old is the earth and how do you know, John? 
You know, I don't actually have the exact timestamp. I don't think anybody does, given especially given the fact that the evolutionary model ranges. You know, they they change it by hundreds of millions of years. So I'm not really sure why that's a uh, direct question, since the other side can't even come close within you know 100 million Next. years. John Rap, thanks for your comment towards stupid horror energy. Says you rule. Good on you, mate. Thumbs up. And N Flat Earth says, sorry, creationism, but evolution wins. Okay, so anyway, I I mean, I guess that's like probably what they would have sounded <laughs> You're like. You're entertaining, said so James. Well. I like but it. thank you for all of your questions, folks. We do have to go because we're over time. I'm so sorry about that. We have not gotten to all the questions, but want to say thanks so much, everybody, for being here. And all of our guests are linked in the description, folks. So if you want to hear more, if this is your first time being exposed to them, hey, you can hear more at those links below. Thank you, all four of you gentlemen, for being here with us today. Thank you, James. It was a blast. One to remember, and I'm glad we had a big audience. That was fun. It's Benny. Live Trump show pleasure. kickoff on my channel in a couple minutes. I have to let you know, folks, this is something I mentioned yesterday. So if you're hanging out with us, I have a groundbreaking announcement. If you were with us yesterday, I had mentioned that we were going to have basically a huge political debate coming up that debate has been confirmed by destiny this morning destiny and Vosh will be taking on Alsup and eric striker on the topic of race and police brutality that's this coming tuesday so that one should be a monster one we've got a lot of other ones like this week is honestly off the charts with with epic debates we're gonna have erica co-modding on wednesday that should be fun and just many more. So with that, I want to say thanks so much for all of your support. Folks, seriously, I can't give enough credit to the speakers. They're the lifeblood of the channel. This channel doesn't exist if we don't have epic speakers like we had today. We really appreciate them. And also thank you for our mods for always wiping out any hate speech. That's really our only strict rule with no warnings. And also thanks for all else you do mods and just the audience just for hanging out here. We really appreciate you guys. You make this channel possible and make it fun. So with that, one last goodbye. Thanks so much to our guests, though. Standing for, standing for truth, John, team, and JL. Thanks for being here, guys. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I you, enjoyed James. it. With that, take care, folks. Have a great rest of your weekend. And keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable.